I'll now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. It is October 25th, 2022 at 9 a.m. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Supervisor Caput? Roll, roll call. call. Oh, I'm sorry. Here. <laughs> Great. McPherson? Here. And Koenig? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you. We'll now have a moment of silence followed by a pledge of allegiance. Does any member of the board wish to recognize anyone during our pledge of allegiance? Or sorry, sure. a moment of silence. Yes, Supervisor uh, Coonerty. Yeah, I just two folks um, that I want to take a moment to recognize. First is Peter Prendel, who is uh, both an educator, and a small business owner, and a real leader in our community. Uh, he passed, and we want to wish uh, his family uh, all our sincerest thoughts and prayers. Wonderful, wonderful man, really dedicated to Santa Cruz and his family. The other one is uh, Jerome Fardet, known to many as Jerry the Barber, uh, really fun character, wonderful guy, a fixture uh, in the community and made every haircut uh, a lot of fun and was a, a, a good author as well. Um, so please keep both of them in our mind, in your minds. Thank you. Well, yeah, uh, if I may, uh, I'll recognize uh, David Trevino, a friend of mine who passed away a month ago and uh, uh, they had his celebration of life last uh, Sunday. And uh, anyway, uh, he was in the army and uh, he was 72 years old. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I just want to uh, recognize Diane Wolfson, uh, a tremendous family, the Wolfson family here. She passed away recently. She was a tremendous uh, uh, public servant and uh, guided to many organizations, in particular at Mega New and some of the others that gave so many hundreds of thousands of dollars of scholarships to our young students here and uh, she was just a wonderful woman just like to recognize her and uh, remember her in our thoughts and prayers and to the best to the wolfson family thank you we'll hold these friends and community members in our hearts Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. CEO Palacios, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda today? Uh, yes, we do have one change uh, item number seven on the regular agenda. Attachment A, packet page 18, is replaced with the correct um, logo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does any board member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda to the regular agenda? Seeing none, we'll proceed with item five, public comment. Any person may address the board during this period. Speakers may not exceed two minutes in length. And individuals may speak only once during public comment. All public comments must be directed to an item listed on today's consent agenda, closed session agenda, yet to be heard on regular agenda, or a topic not on the agenda that is within the jurisdiction of the board. Board members will not take actions or respond immediately to any public communication presented regarding topics not on the agenda, but may choose to follow up later. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold has to do with integrity of the vote. Uh, we have a Tweedledum, Tweedledee, two different political parties, and no matter who you vote for, you, you get a global oni. Uh, you get a politician that's pro-red China, as I've mentioned many times, these people involved here locally with the Panetta machine. Uh, also, Charles Munger, uh, whose products for Walmart, 80% of their products come from red China. They've ganged up on democracy uh, in the state of California and effectively got rid of uh, the Progressive Party, the American Party, uh, the Libertarian Party, et cetera. 
um, and that was funded by Munger. That, that initiative came from him. Munger's also been buying up uh, Republican Central Committees uh, Mr. Uh, Arnold, under the spirit of democracy. Your comments to items within the jurisdiction of the Board of Supervisors. I'm sorry you're intervening me. That's a violation of my free speech. This has to, vote integrity has to do with the people that are buying off the politicians, and I can name some here today. I'm talking about uh, Tom Campbell, who's ma managing uh, Liz Lawler's campaign. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, he came out against hardly, very strongly against the Republican Party, as did Jim Reed, the council member uh, who is endorsed by the Republican Central Committee. He was the city manager while uh, the courts were looking at the police stand down while Republican uh, voters were, were messed with. We also know that you had two supervisors here threatening people of the Grange. Uh, various members of the Republican Committee are sponsored by these uh, Munger mail outs. Um, uh, the person's running against uh, Gale. Uh, Gail uh, has a supporter who attended a communist celebration at the Loudon Nelson Center and the son of a KGB recruiter was there. So we really don't have a choice between those two globalists. The Republican Central Committees do not have two thirds of their members available online and one third not even mentioning their name. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Craig Cabot, you were missed last week. That was amazing. I don't even know what to say, except maybe if I were behind the scenes at Bohemian Grove, might have been something similar to what I witnessed last week in this room. You know, about one of the many consent agenda items uh, about the digital wallet in the 1,299 pages, uh, 113 to 115, you know, you guys are just really following scripts. I don't really expect anybody to believe what I'm saying. You should do your own research. But um, software was created in October of 20, of 2000 that could affect the um, digital voting machines. We do not have voting security whatsoever. I could be very specific, but what's the point? So uh, let's see what to say. You know, I was listening to something this morning and I thought it was very factually accurate. Um, Mike Adams was interviewing um, Karen Kingston again. This is not new information about what's in these uh, mnra vaccines, but I like this. The Fosse plea. I am a genocidal sociopath. I wish I wasn't looking at so many people that seem to appear to be that way by what they're doing. I didn't stand for the Pledge of Allegiance because under maritime law, any flag that has a fringe around it is a captured flag. I don't know when exactly our constitution was completely destroyed, but I believe it was on February 23rd, 1871, when the Organics Act was acted, and that created corporate personhood. Any city, state, county, you guys are corporations. The people that you support are your stockholders, and it's not generally the people by what you guys present. Um, this is a shirt I got, Watsonville Ivy League Schools. I don't have any more time to comment, but Thank it's nice to see me. you here. Thanks. Good morning, Board of Supervisors, uh, Chair Koenig. Uh, Michael Beaton, Director of General Services. I'm here today to introduce to your board, Megan Riley, who has been appointed to the position of Deputy Director of General Services. Megan uh, comes to the county with an extensive educational background uh, which a bat with a bachelor's degree in history from Loyola College, a master's degree in management from the Naval Postgraduate School, and a law degree from Monterey College of Law. Coupled with her educational endeavors, Megan possesses over 32 years of experience in the public sector. She has continuously advanced throughout her career in public service, holding positions such as budget analyst, controller, executive director of business services, chief financial officer, chief business officer, and most recently, the deputy superintendent of LA Unified School District. Megan and her husband, Bill, are residents of Santa Cruz County, and we are honored to have her leadership and experience join our team and the county family. With that, I would like to turn over the microphone uh, over to Deputy Director Riley for a few comments. Thank you, Michael. 
Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Um, my name is Megan Riley, as you so heard. Um, I just want to express my deep appreciation and excitement about joining the County of Santa Cruz. It has been a dream of mine to come back to our home in Santa Cruz, um, where the beautiful Redwoods are here and um, wonderful expression of joining a government entity such as the county that protects our communities in such ways. Um, I have such a deep appreciation, especially after the last three years that we've gone through um, the role that the county plays in maintaining the highest standards of professionalism and protection for our community members. So um, thank you so much, day two. And I am um, ecstatic. And my husband is even happier than I am to be um, back in Santa Cruz. So thank you. And um, I just wanted to say hello. Thank you and welcome Deputy Director Riley. So we're ecstatic to have you and look forward to all the good work you get up to. Hi, good morning. Thank you. My name is Greg Cotton. I'm a local marine biologist and um, I'd like to, uh, we have come to one of the most important environmental and cultural moments in at least a generation or more. A sand and gravel mine uh, that threatens the most important ceremonial uh, sacred site of the indigenous community that you represent uh, is uh, threatened. The Sergeant Corey in the Santa Cruz Mountains is un is over the border of the Santa Cruz County line, but it threatens the Pajaro River watershed wildlife corridor arteries for the Santa Cruz, Diablo, and Gavilan mountain ranges. It only uses a hundred year floodplain in its plan and the processing site is in the Pajaro River floodplain. It will produce profits for San Diego Corporation as much as 15 jobs and, and sand that no one asked for. Every major environmental and political organization stands with the tribe. This is our local standing rock issue and we need to voice and join the protection of the site. The permit, which will put several pits hundreds of feet deep in the Santa Cruz mountains and is in the final stages of public review. The tribe has gone to the United Nations for support to stop us from allowing this crime against humanity. It will be a crime against humanity, but we need to prove that we're better than that on the central coast. Public review ends on November 7th. Please pass this re a resolution as soon as possible. Commissioner Coonerty, thank you for your excellent letter in support of this. I brought materials from your constituents as well as the tribe and the Santa Cruz City Council resolution that passed unanimously here to share with you today to move this process forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. Hello, my name is Byers, and there's an item on your agenda today around uh, citizens assemblies and democratic lotteries. And I wanted to convey that a representative body, body of people selected by lottery to deliberate the housing issue, that's, um, that that is currently the best option to achieve majority consensus. The usual approach consists of self-selected groups or politician appointed committees. At best, I'm really out of breath. At best, these groups lack diversity and imagination. At worst, they create slanted, one sided recommendations, which in turn creates more distrust and division. That kind of division and distrust is the exact opposite of government responsibility and opposite of for the public good. We now know that there is a far better process on the table. Um, selecting a group of people at random, much like jury selections, ensures a body free from political or party politician bias. I was an observer in Petaluma when they used a citizen's assembly to address a contentious issue in their municipality. And I'd be happy to talk about my observations one-on-one -on -one or with an invitation to speak with more time. Municipalities all over the world, not just recently in Petaluma or ancient Greece, have practiced a version of sortition or citizens' assemblies, democratic lotteries. For now, you are being introduced or maybe even reintroduced to the best option for public buy-in. 
creating a citizens assembly to have people from all walks, regions, and housing circumstances in life to come together, deliberate, sincerely hear and be heard by the other to reach a kind of community agreement. This civic process is intentionally built for the public good, not individual or privileged group. And it's the best option we have. Thank you. Thank you, Byers. Good morning, supervisors. I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, I want to talk about um, the election and uh, Boulder Creek Recreation and Park District. Uh, on your consent agenda, you have a bunch of appointments to elected boards, uh, uh, candidates who were unopposed uh, in this current election. Well, two years ago, uh, this board appointed two people, uh, a couple of people to the BCRPD board of directors. Um, one of them announced her resignation at the board meeting on last Wednesday night. And uh, what happened is that she received her ballot and did not find measure T on her ballot. And when she inquired, she realized that she didn't live in the district. Um, now, actually, the board member who resigned was a replacement for a board member that you appointed two years ago. Um, so when I thought about it later, I realized that office should have been on the ballot right now for a two-year term because she replaced someone who was elected to a four-year term in 2020. Uh, even if she had lived in the district, she should have been on the ballot this year. So the board of directors failed to call an election. And I just wanted to uh, make you aware that section 10,004 of the elections code gives you the authority to uh, call an election since their board neglected to do so. Uh, and then also I wanna mention that there's another member of the board that was appointed in 2020 who currently lives in Bonnie Dune, He's registered to vote in Bonnie Dune. Uh, he was at the board meeting last Wednesday night, and it was clear from the video that he's living in Bonnie Dune and he's not qualified to be a director of BCRPD. So thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Seeing no one else here in chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, Chair, there is. Call in user one, you can unmute yourself. Thanks to the comments of the previous speakers and uh, please follow the advice of Mr. Cotton. What I'd like to share is an article, the implementation of the QR code for absolute control by Peter Koenig. And this talks about digital technology and very much related to item 16 of the digital wallet, which I think should be abandoned. This is transcribed from the German. You can access it by globalresearch.ca, which is Canada, or the script from KLA TV. Peter Koenig, same spelling as uh, the chair of the board here, worked as an economist at the World Bank for over 30 years and has implemented water projects in developing countries on various uh, continents. And he states he's an economist and geopolitical analyst and he try as best as possible to reflect the ever-changing today's um, in respect to analyze tomorrow's situations. In other words, to connect the dots, the dots between COVID, the Ukraine war, the reset, the QR code that is becoming more and more obtrusive. 
and planning the fourth industrial revolution, that's in quotes, by Klaus Schwab. Skipping to another part, in short, what the West, especially the United States, has always wanted is control of the largest and richest country in the world, Russia, with by far Thank the you, most Garrett. mineral resources. Rafa Sonnenfeld, your microphone is now available. Yes, uh, good morning, supervisors. Um, the county has a plan uh, for thousands, or uh, I'm calling regarding the uh, the housing element update process. Um, the county has to plan for thousands of new homes, 4,634 to be exact. And the deadline to certify this plan for the state is December 31st of next year. If the county doesn't have an adopted certified housing element on that date, we will not only lose eligibility for millions of dollars of, of affordable housing funds, but our local zoning and general plan will no longer be in effect for any project that proposes at least 20% affordable housing units, and the county will have no legal authority to reject those projects. We're already seeing this happen in Santa Monica and Redondo Beach, where over 10,000 new homes have been proposed, which must, must be approved in those cities, despite not being in conformance with those cities' zoning. The, uh, our county's current timeline to adopt a compliant housing element, which uh, according to your agenda packet, uh, the county's not even proposing to do a study session until the end of next year, uh, assures we will be in the same position as those cities. I, I uh, urge the county to plan for a more aggressive approach to achieving a compliant housing element by December 31st of next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sonnenfeld. Kyle Kelly, your microphone is now available. There we go. Hey, thank you all. Uh, this is Kyle Kelly, um, also calling about. Uh, oh, shoot, sorry, I was just making sure my mic was working there. <laughs> uh, also call, calling about the, the housing element. Um, you know, there's, there's actually, I think, Four grants, I mean, it actually extends beyond affordable housing grants that we would lose access to if we don't have our housing elements certified on time. Um, and I know for this county, they'll want robust public process for getting it done. Um, and I don't think people realize that delaying is actually going to cause a lot more building later. Uh, when they could actually just do the planning, get the grants, get things done, and kind of just follow state law. Um, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm just advising, as I think, some of the jurisdictions within our county are actually uh, on on target or ahead. Um, right now, City of Santa Cruz and the City of Watsonville are both likely to uh, complete their housing elements on time. Uh, Scotts Valley, Capitola, and the County of Santa Cruz are are currently off mark right now and, and will be subject to uh, the builder's remedy and loss of funds from the state uh, if they don't get moving more quickly. Um, I'm just pointing this out as just kind of a factual piece. You know, there's like a part of me that kind of looks forward to if cities fail to meet their standards, then we deal with the builder's remedy and we could see much bigger projects going up. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think it's, you know, of the of the benefit to constituents to just get the plans done, get them done on time and, and delivered well. Uh, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. We have no more speakers on Zoom. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. I want to um, bring to you and the public uh, a draft Santa Cruz County Fire Code Ordinance. It's a 21 page document. Your board and uh, the public will see for the first time, I'm told November 15th. I was able to obtain this 21 page draft at a central fire district board meeting wherein it was on the agenda, but the draft was not in the agenda. Staff was kind enough to give me a copy and it is now on the central fire website in there. Uh, community risk reduction area. I'm concerned about this because this is a new way the county will adopt their fire codes. 
all of it will be done before you. The public will not see it until the agenda goes up. Central Fire Board will not see it until the, it goes up. They did not approve it. They did not even see it. And I'm concerned about this process because there are a lot of major changes in it that will affect rural residents like me and the CZU people. Speaking of the CZU fire survivors, I again ask that your board demand that county fire conduct an after action review for the 2020 CZU lightning fire complex. That has never been done. I listened last night to the wonderful uh, Prospect Heights Firewise meeting where they had several officials, including you, Chair Koenig, and there had been a review of the De La Viega fire. And out of that came great improvements. And here we are as a county with the largest fire in the county and county fire department volunteers and staff have not been consulted and there is no after action review for the CZU fire. That is unacceptable and we need to do it right now, please. Thank, Thank you, you. Burner. All right, if there are no further public comments, I'll return it to the board for action on the consent agenda. Are there any comments? Hey, Mr. Chair, yes, uh, on the consent agenda, I wanted to comment on a few items uh, regarding item number 36, uh, the Veterans Village in Ben Lomond. I wanna thank the county personnel and project partners in this effort to provide 20 housing units to veterans and their families. It's a remarkable project, an important one, and one that has broad community support in the San Lorenzo Valley in particular and throughout Santa Cruz County. On item number 40, the uh, County Service Area 7 expansion, uh, th I, the county project team that's been working on this, uh, fine tuning this proposal for many months. I wanna thank them for their efforts, including representatives from uh, Community Development and, and Infrastructure, CDI, environmental health and the CAO. Uh, this is a huge undertaking that we're going about, one that carries uh, significant environmental, economic and recovery goals. The need go for this goes back more than 25 years in Boulder Creek to fix overdraft septic systems. And now with the tighter state regulations and the need to rebuild after the fire, it's even more important that we we have these options. Uh, we're quite hopeful that the state will fund the big share of this project, which has already garnered support from the, and the federal level. Uh, thanks to our ongoing, uh, outgoing, I should say, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. Uh, I look forward to the study session in January and to delve more into the specifics of this project in the future. Um, also, um, the written correspondence, uh, speaking of um, Anna Eshoo, uh, who we honored at our meeting last week, I wanted to note that her recent letter to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, once again, requesting a resolution to the county's unreimbursed expenses that are in the millions of dollars from the CZU fi lightning fire. We appreciate her ongoing effort. I know she's going to stick with it, even though she, after this election in November, she will not be representing uh, the North County of Santa Cruz, but will be represented by Jimmy Panetta, will be a, an excellent representative. And I can assure you, he is well aware of this, uh, this need for Santa Cruz County to fund uh, the, the recovery of that uh, from the fire. So I just want, those are a couple of comments that I wanted to make, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Anyone else? Supervisor Cabot? This is for uh, items not on the agenda. Uh, for consent agenda. Uh, items on the consent agenda? Maybe. Right. Uh, All right. Supervisor Friend? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to briefly comment on item 16, which is the, uh, well, actually, I have two brief comments, but item 16, which is the digital wallet pilot appreciation for the county administrative staff that's been working on this in particular, Ms. Benson, who's taken a leadership role on this in our uh, ISD team. Uh, I'm very excited to see this pilot move forward. I'm very excited to see uh, some of the things that have already been constructed as possible uh, items to include into the wallet, including um, uh, some of the work with the Sheriff's Office Parks, Environmental Health, and our planning team. I would like to encourage uh, county staff as we move forward in, in light of the recent state legislation passage. I think that the real equity 
um, element of the of the wallet will be that allowing uh, critical and vital records to be included. I recognize the in perpetuity concerns of county staff. I'll say though that it, it, we can't. Uh, obviously, uh, what we can say is that the, the digitization of records and, and in particular technology expansion is is not going to become any less over time. So. I think preparing for that makes more sense than not. And I wouldn't share the same concern about, uh, uh, I know that the board letter doesn't say that it's not gonna happen, but just raises this red flag about the possibility of how this would be maintained over time. Well, um, you know, we're, we're in a, a world that this, this kind of change is gonna continue to happen. And I think that we should find ways to meet people where they are, uh, in particular, uh, members in our community that generally don't engage with government in a traditional way, uh, those that use this kind of technology are disproportionately low income. Um, in our community, it's disproportionately those in South County. And I think that we should find ways to ensure that they have access to these vital records moving forward. Also, uh, for younger generations, they're going to use this kind of technology. So I'm fine with the pilot program uh, starting as proposed, but I'd like to see uh, this transition into vital records sooner than later, because I do believe that that really will be uh, one of the greatest case studies for this. But this is a uh, really is a very forward thinking and groundbreaking uh, component that the county is doing. And I appreciate the work of all the county staff that's, that's uh, exploring this possibility. Uh, the last thing is, is just on item 38. Speaking of equity, the continued investment in the South County Service Center, um, continued appreciation. Two county staff has taken a lead on this. Uh, this has been a priority for both Supervisor Caput and myself that, that these services be available for South County residents. And by the way, that our employees don't have to do a commute and, and uh, continue to clog up Highway 1 as we are responsible for that as well. Uh, this board, a uh, really true appreciation of, to you, the chair, Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Cooner, you've you've never wavered on your investment in, in the South County Service Center and have making sure that those services are available for South County residents and our employees that live down there. So uh, just a lot of appreciation that investment in equity for South County. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. I'll just add uh, some comments for a few items here. On item 17, the progress report on a Santa Cruz like me, I wanna thank the CAO's office for presenting us with this. Um, and I think it just is important to remember that we are seeing consistent underrepresentation from South County, from Latinos, renters, youth, and people with disabilities on our county commissions and in our public engagement process in general. And uh, I'll speak a little bit more about it as we get to item Eight, but I do think there's an incredible opportunity here to uh, take a, a different tack and uh, correct some of that lack of represented uh, representation that we've seen in the past. On item 20, accepting improvements for 1080 M-Line HVAC and lighting project. I just want to thank General Services for all their work on this project. You know, it's it's uh, having having toured the Emmeline campus and the Freedom campus. It's, it's clear it's a challenge to maintain our county buildings. We just do not have enough money for for maintenance. Um, but this project is a great example of what we can do when we do take care of our existing infrastructure. And uh, 1080 is really looking fantastic. That goes for item 29 and uh, the near completion of Suite D at the Freedom Health Campus as well. Excited to see that open up and the expanded services uh, for clients there. I also want to thank on item 29 HSA, uh, or congratulate them on, on filling all 23 full-time employee positions there. I know that was, uh, I'm sure, not easy in the present environment. Um, it's great to see they'll be able to expand, expand client services. And then finally, on item 27, increasing our agreement with Janice of Santa Cruz by $3.5 million for the addition of peer support services, recovery housing, and expanded service. I just want to thank Janice for everything they do for our community, and it's, it's great to see this expanded uh, services in, in our community. And that's all I have. So if there are, are no further comments, I'm looking for Supervisor Caput. All right, yeah, go ahead. Uh, item 37, uh, the plan? I'm sorry, Supervisor Caput, your microphone's not on. I'm sorry. Yes. Item 37, approved plans uh, for the cost estimate of uh, 500 uh, West Ridge Drive. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, project for South County will have services in many areas for the county for people from South County so they don't have to drive 
uh, from Watsonville or in the unincorporated area all the way to Santa Cruz uh, to get things done. Uh, it'll uh, allow them to uh, be closer to the county government. And also it will take a significant amount of traffic off of Highway 1 going to and from South uh, County to Santa Cruz. So anyway, it's a great project. So December 8th, I guess it's opening up for bid uh, to convert the Westridge uh, property into a county facility. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Is there a motion on the consent agenda? I'll move the recommended actions. Motion by Supervisor Kennedy, second by Supervisor McPherson to adopt the consent agenda. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Caput? McPherson? Aye. Aye. And Coney? Aye. We have, a, we have a vote. Thank you. The consent agenda being passed, we'll proceed with item seven to consider a report on recycling and solid waste long-term planning process, direct community development and infrastructure to return on or before October 17th, 2023 with a recycling and solid waste long-term planning report, adopt resolution supporting the trash talkers initiative and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the deputy CAO, director of community development and infrastructure. And for a report on this item, we have Casey Colossa, our Recycling and Solid Waste Services Manager, and Bo Hawksford, Department Administrative Analyst. Please take it away. I believe, uh, Bo, if you can turn on your mic there, the gray button on the base of the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Koenig and members of the board for the opportunity to share some highlights with the County Recycling and Solid Waste Services. Recycling and solid waste services is responsible for all aspects of waste management, uh, which includes preparing for the closure of the Buena Vista landfill, designing a transfer facility to replace it be before it closes, as well as operations and maintenance of the, both the Buena, <coughs> excuse me, Buena Vista landfill and the Ben Lomond transfer station. We're not we are regulated by state environmental laws, uh, including the most recent, cl recent climate action bill, SB 1383. Uh, this slide uh, and the next slide that we're gonna share uh, were completed during a st study session a few years ago uh, with our consultant HFNH, uh, where we mapped out how we were going to accomplish our goals of waste diversion, given the legal trends and changing economic climate. Our vision for the future of solid waste and diversion in Santa Cruz County takes into consideration um, the values and aspirations of the community. We all want to live in a community that we can be proud of, a community that is innovative and a leader in promoting sustainable environment. While we've been planning for a transfer station to be co-located with a compost facility at the Buena Vista landfill, we have also been looking at the potential for alternatives to composting such as waste to energy technologies, such as gasification, or even the potential for an anaerobic digester. Both of those types of technologies would help with items that are truly not compostable in a compost facility, such as compostable foodware and cups. In fact, uh, we may want to look at revising our biodegradable packaging ordinance to exclude these items, as they will not compost in the time frame of most commercial composting programs. SB 1383 implementation began in January of this year, and its primary goal is to reduce methane gas from the atmosphere. The number one contributor of methane gas to our atmosphere is open landfills that leak methane from rotting organics that turn into methane as is leaked into the atmosphere. Food waste is now being diverted from landfills in every jurisdiction in the state. Our program allows curbside customers to use their existing green organics cart to dispose of food waste. All food and food related items are currently accepted except for raw meat and compostable foodware. Outreach and education is being uh, conducted by both county and greenway staff. 
And while enforcement by the state has already begun, fines will not be issued in, for non-compliance to jurisdictions until January of 2024. Another aspect of 1383 is to collect edible food before it actually becomes waste. The amount of food insecurity in California is staggering. We're lucky in Santa Cruz County that we have the nation's second ever food bank, and in California, it was the first. They are a great partner, and they're actually helping the county as well as all four cities in helping us to fulfill the requirement of uh, uh, food recovery. SB 1383 requires a group effort by many government agencies. It's not just about diverting food from the landfill. There is also a procurement requirement to purchase materials made from uh, diverted organics, such as compost and biofuels, which would involve the county's uh, uh, purchasing and fleet departments. We need to have places to use these products, such as our public parks and other county facilities. We have already been in discussions with our environmental health department uh, regarding their assistance with inspections at food establishments and other food businesses to help ensure compliance with uh, SB 1383. And as we've been saying uh, to this board for many years that the end of life is coming pretty soon to the Buena Vista landfill. In fact, we've been planning for it's er in earnest to ensure that we continue to have a local facility for residents to dispose of their waste and recycling. <clears throat> this board recently held a protest vote for a new solid waste infrastructure and closure charge. In June, after a proper notice of the hearing went out to all affected parcel owners, indicating how they may protest and when the hearing would, would take place. We received few protests and the charge passed and was placed on the 2022 uh, parcel tax bill that just recently was mailed out. This charge will pay for the design and construction of the new transfer facility, as well as a co-located co compost facility at the Buena Vista landfill. Construction is planned in such a way that the facilities will be completed before the landfill is closed. And while we have been saving for the closure of the landfill for some time, uh, a recent new inflation factor estimate was provided to the county. And this new infrastructure charge does include uh, the remaining of the closure costs, and we will be fully funded with the closure fund before the, the landfill closes. <clears throat> Illegal dumping, uh, as all of you know, is a big problem, uh, not just in Santa Cruz County, but in the entire state of California. Uh, our green waste franchise actually includes three bulky item setouts per customer per calendar year. And the number of bulky items collected increased each year since we began the program in 2018. And in 2021, a total of 4,463 items were disposed of properly through this program. We partner with many community organizations that help to keep our community clean, and yet we still, to, still see illegal dump sites throughout the county. With this board's direction, we have been looking into various cameras that we can use that will utilize infrared technology in the hopes that we will uh, help us deter and hopefully catch people engaging in illegal activity uh, so that we can um, help to deter more people from doing this. We're also discussing with the downtown streets team uh, the potential for a hotspot crew and that can roam to all hotspots throughout the county uh, five days a week. They'd be rot rotating through the various districts. We've also obtained a grant through, the Caltran through Caltrans that we can utilize to clean up litter and legal dumping on the state right of ways. Another funding source to support the illegal pr dumping program is the recently passed single use cup charge. Uh, the charge did begin on July 1st, 2022, and the county will start beginning to collect half of that 25 cent charge beginning on January 1st, 2023. Uh, we hope to use this funding for uh, all, all aspects of litter cleanup as well, especially on both private and, uh, and public places. As we all know, there's, a, there's, there's places like on along the M-Line uh, campus right now. 
Another form of illegal dumping that we field complaints from quite often is that of people poaching um, or people using other people's carts without their permission. Uh, much of these complaints are coming from areas where we have cluster collection points. Uh, we are working with Green Waste to help to resolve this issue by working towards uh, reducing the amount of cluster collection points throughout the county. Green Waste was recently able to purchase two smaller uh, collection trucks that can traverse the small, narrow, uh, non-publicly maintained roads that are common in the rural areas of the county where the cluster collection points are predominant. With more vehicles, they could begin to offer similar services to customers that currently uh, have to utilize their, these cl cluster collection points. And outreach and education is ongoing from county and greenway staff of all the services, waste reduction and recycling programs to the county residents to inform them of all, of, all of these services. As part of the board letter and today's report, is a relatively new initiative led by local citizens called Trash Talkers. This group meets monthly with other local organizations to address illegal dumping issues throughout the county. They are starting with issues in the South County and plan to expand countywide in the future. Attached to the board letter and shown on this slide is the Trash Talkers logo. Since the work of this group fits in well with the county's strategic plan element to protect natural resources, the county intends to help support the group's website and help with placement of their logo through the community in order to raise awareness and rally support to make Santa Cruz County the cleanest county in the state. We now ask the board to take the recommended actions to accept and file the Recycling and Solid Waste Long-Term Planning Progress Report and recommendations on zero waste planning direct the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure to return on or before October 17th, 2023 with the Recycling and Solid Waste Long-Term Planning Progress Report and to adopt resolution supporting the Trash Talkers Initiative and direct county staff to offer support and assistance to the citizen-led beautification effort. Thank you for your time and we welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hawksford. Other comments or questions from members of the board? Uh, Supervisor McPherson. I don't know. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, and I, I want to thank you for the update. Uh, I know this has been going on a long time. We've been talking about the Buena Vista Landfills Lifeline for many, many years. And the county has been a leader in the solid waste uh, and recycling issues for years. And I appreciate the efforts to continue this long-term planning related to our landfills. Um, to that end, the, the policy questions and future costs pertaining to the closure or reuse of the Buena Vista Landfill are, are really far reaching, I believe. And so I think it's imperative for the board and the public to have a detailed understanding of that situation. Um, I, I am prepared to, um, and I of course wanna hear from other board members, but to support the recommended actions of number two and three today, but the first recommended action to approve the long-term zero waste planning needs, um, I believe needs more consideration than we are able to give it today. Uh, for example, we have no information in this report on the CEQA alternatives um, that might be analyzed and which is accorded to the significant future and the cost of the close of the refill. Uh, costs that will be borne by the county and the ratepayers for many, many years. So um, I would like the board, especially considering the fact that we're also going to have uh, two uh, new members in a matter of months or the first of the year, uh, to have additional time to ask clarifying questions on that and have a clear understanding of um, the staff assumptions and to gather more information from the community development and infrastructure department and to endorsing the next steps. Um, so that would be my my proposal, but I, I'd really like to hear the comments first before formally making that motion. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Okay. Supervisor Caput. <laughs> Uh, uh, thanks a lot for your report. Uh, you guys have been doing a lot of a lot of work, getting ready uh, for different projects for the county. And uh, I, I see your department uh, moving up as far as uh, uh, a priority department uh, in the future. Uh, you, you're going to get more attention. You're going to get more oversight. 
uh, the environment is a key thing uh, for the future of everybody. And uh, the younger generation is very in tune to the uh, environmental projects. Uh, I guess uh, one of the things we have to be very careful about is protecting our uh, ocean. Uh, I guess if we lived in Nevada or east all the way to Virginia, uh, we wouldn't be so concerned about it. But we're right here on the ocean. And uh, the what's uh, the critical... Uh, the, I know plastic is a very confusing thing. What is recyclable, what is not, uh, what to throw away in the garbage, what to throw away in the recycle. You have all those, uh, especially with the takeout now after the pandemic, <clears throat> or, the, or the black uh, food trays, uh, plastic food trays, are they recyclable? Uh, I know clear is, and some of the uh, some of the plastics uh, were not recyclable. Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, Casey Colosso, recycling and solid waste services manager. So, yeah, you're you're correct. There are many types of plastics. Uh, green waste recovery has assured us that they can recycle them. They just require them to be cleaned. And, and and dry, uh, they can be placed in the blue recycle cart or bin, and they will sort through them and um, find markets where they can be recycled. But the, it, there are a lot of different types of plastics. Some are more valuable to recycle than others. And um, there is some work uh, maybe for extended producer responsibility legislation to have the plastic industry be more responsible about uh, creating recycle markets for that or making it easier to recycle. But it is a, definitely a big issue. There are a lot of single-use plastic items in the recycling bin. Okay, and then uh, there there was a part in there about the education part. Uh, the public uh, is very uh, willing to uh, participate. I think one of the key things is if we go into any fast food uh, establishment, uh, I know some of them have recycle bins. They have uh, uh, garbage bins, compost bins. Uh, most of them don't, though. So uh, we we really have to get uh, business on our side. Uh, what do you, what do you uh, how do you envision getting businesses to be more cooperative on this? Uh, we have uh, county staff, and also Greenways has uh, Greenways Recovery has outreach and education staff that go out and visit uh, businesses to help them you know, improve the recycling, have adequate capacity. Um, that That is uh, something we acknowledge that there is a lot of, there is a lack of, you know, front of house or whatever, front of business um, carts or whatever bins for separating recycles yeah. uh, for the customers of the, you know, fast food restaurants and um, to use. So that is uh, something we need to improve on, but, uh, you know, we have that in the works. Yeah. Uh, and one uh, other area that kind of interests me is uh, plastic does, it breaks down into smaller and smaller tiny particles, right? And then when it gets in the ocean, uh, the fish eat it, uh, it gets in the food. I understand it, it even gets in uh, the clothes washer, the dishwasher, and all that. Uh, does it ever break down completely? Or does it just get smaller and smaller and uh, keep floating out there? I assume maybe and eventually it'll break down or metabolize and get deconstructed. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's at a microscopic level. So you're right. All all the marine life can ingest it and pass it on, and we could eventually eat the fish that would have you know small bits of microplastic. Um, I know it's a big issue. You're correct. It's in our wastewater. It passes through uh, the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, you know, we have uh, clothing that, you know, when it's washed, little bits of, uh, you know, plastic fibers come off. Um, so it's it's definitely an issue and it's being studied. And um, yeah, you're correct that it it, I know. it doesn't break down in, in, a, in a 
you know, a reasonable time frame. It's it's out there for a long time. Right. And uh, how's it going? Last question uh, with China, or are they not taking uh, like before? Uh, or are they getting less and less cooperative? They're being a lot more choosy about the uh, material they import in to recycle. Um, that that has put a lot of pressure on the you know the whole entire country, especially the West Coast, who ships a lot of recyclable material to China. Um, you know, I think it has spurred some innovation and maybe some local uh, recycling options, but it, it definitely had a big effect on um, the recycling market for. Uh, for you know our franchise holiday to, to utilize. You bet. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, you guys, I think, like I said, they're going to be a key department in the future uh, and move right up uh, the priority list. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you, Supervisor Captain. Thank yeah. you both for this report. I, I, you know, I was really struck by um, the organics piece of it, and I had no idea that. 50, nearly 50% 50 of residential waste is organics. And um, of course that is becomes one of the top producers of methane in our state, uh, which is an extremely potent greenhouse gas and 80 times is in, in the short term, more uh, warming impacts than CO2, which is incredible. So, I mean, we definitely have our state colleagues to thank for passing SB 1383 uh, and looking forward to its impact. I'm just curious with the, eight years of anticipated lifespan left at, at Buena Vista. Is that counting on the elimination of organics from the waste stream or is it, uh, would that have to be factored in still? Yeah, that, that would factor in the reduction of, uh, organics. Um, I mean, we've been, been reducing our annex for decades now, the, the yard waste and yard trimmings wood waste, but now with the addition of, uh, removing food and then our improvement going forward with that, um, it should extend the life of landfill. Um, most food, you know, breaks down in the landfill. It's like an anaerobic digester, so it doesn't really take up a lot of space, but it does produce methane. And we are, you know, we're required by state law to, um, to stop, you know, to reduce the amount of organics going into our landfill. Got it. So that, so the eight year life expectancy is, all, is if we get the organics, uh, I mean, when we get the organics out of the waste stream. So if we hadn't, if it weren't for SB 1383, we'd be looking at whatever, three to five years or something much shorter. It would be slightly shorter. Yeah. Okay. Um, other question is, I mean, closure of Buena Vista landfill, I understand it could be pretty expensive. What are you guys currently budgeting for in terms of the money that we've saved? And what, what's the budget for the closure costs today? Our current, our current uh, closure fund balance is approximately $8 billion that we have that we've been saving for many years. And with the new infrastructure charge, it takes into, it does take into consideration our new inflation rate. Um, the 1993 rate uh, was, we started with a beginning balance of about $6.6 .6 million, I believe, um, of what it was getting in, in inflation factors. And the new inflationary estimate um, went from we were looking at about $10 million in today's dollars and it jumped up to 16 million. And that, that extra amount of cost is was factored into the new infrastructure charge. So we'll be saving a lot more per year to once we, when we start receiving that funding. And we, we know by the time that we actually do get to the closure cost uh, that we will be fully funded uh, at that $16 million level. And clo closure, you know, there's multiple ways to do it, um, but it all, we're looking now with our, uh, we're looking more that we're going to be doing more of a, a lot of clay. We have to bring a lot of clay and a lot of fresh dirt um, to to actually help to seal it, not just trucking costs alone. And that's where that extra costs are coming in. Okay, so you're saying you're currently expecting closure costs to be about sixteen million dollars. Sixteen million dollars, yeah. Okay, I mean, I've heard it can be extremely expensive to you know get 
closure past state and federal agencies and um that you know it could even it could be in the tens of million i mean maybe even more north of 50 million dollars so i think that's a number that i'm really interested in seeing us drill down into and having some certainty about um and i think it's sort of at the the heart of some of mcpherson's concerns as well yeah we, we we've been working with um our our landfill consultants geosyntech who've who know that landfill probably better than a lot of people. They've been they've been our consultants for more than a decade, and they they're the ones that have that that gave us the new estimate. Um, and they they're they're conservative. They were on the conservative side, so uh, they estimated on the high side, and it's a little bit more than sixty million. I'm using that as a, just a rough number, um, but that in today's dollars is the current estimate by the professional people that would would know how, uh, what it should cost to close okay thank you supervisor friend yes mr chair i i just um well i appreciate the presentation i'm actually a little bit um I, I could use some clarity on what Supervisor McPherson is actually asking for here, or maybe uh, Director Machado could help with this. Um, because, I mean, today it looks like a report, kind of a plan to move forward on some of the zero waste um, recommendations, meaning I, I didn't really see this as sort of a high uh, risk item to just kind of move forward today. So if I could get clarity, Supervisor McPherson, exactly why you want to yank the first part out of the recommended actions, maybe a little bit more succinctly, and then, then we could see with the, the professional staff here whether the, some of those issues could be addressed uh, as opposed to coming back. And also seeing that uh, approval of things like this help them move along, march along on the grant and, and funding side. And so I think that it's useful for us to be considerate of that timeline too. But if you could just maybe provide some explanation, that'd be helpful. Yeah, I can do that. Um, it's really uh, the. Inf I think we uh, need more information on the, the CEQA alternatives pr in particular. I think that's going to be a key point of it. I know we've been looking at this for a long time, uh, but I think that that's important. And also because we're going to have two seated supervisors and uh, it's going to be impactful. Um, this is at least eight years away. Uh, but um, I think that they uh, it would be wise to have let them have some input into it too. But I think it's more the the CEQA alternatives that uh, the issue that I'm I'm concerned about. All right. I mean, look. I mean, one of us is in my district. Ben Loman's in your district, and and we're not going anywhere. So I mean, the two new supervisors I appreciate we're going to have, but I don't really see that as relevant on the CEQA side. I mean, it's project specific. I mean, so when the time comes, but but perhaps uh, Director Machado can can provide some clarity on the CEQA alternatives component. Yep. Please, Director Machado. All right. Thank you. Good morning, Matt Machado, uh, Director CDI. Uh, just to get into the details a little bit more, uh, we are preparing CEQA documents now, and we're hoping to release a notice of preparation in the coming months. And we're looking at alternatives, uh, both for the organics and for transfer stations of the future as part of the closure um, action. Uh, I, I think the most critical piece that requires a lot of alternative consideration is the organic processing. And I can share with you that we're looking at those alternatives now and we'll process them through uh, the CEQA document. Uh, some of those alternatives include looking uh, to partner with our, our neighbors down in the marina um, landfill and their compost facility, uh, looking at constructing our own compost facility, looking at some innovative ideas to convert directly to energy. And I, I recall uh, having a bit of this conversation in front of your board recently about a waste to energy type, you know, anaerobic digestion or um, gasification. There's a lot of different processes. So we hope to flesh all of those out through a CEQA process uh, in the coming months as part of our alternative consideration. And so I, I would assure the board that we will get to that. Uh, it's a requirement of CEQA and a requirement of proceeding with um, with all these efforts, actually capital efforts and and uh, policy efforts as we go forward. So hopefully, um, you know, that may answer it or we can discuss more. So answer any questions that you may have. I appreciate that. You, we all want to get at this as quickly as possible and all, but I think why not? I think I'm I'm looking at the first part of next year that we can answer some of these questions or have the, the, the more of the data before us. So that's that's. I think it's worth the wait. We've waited so long, and that's why I'm just uh, requesting that. I don't want a specific date on it, but I think it'll be the first part of uh, 2023. Okay. Thank you. Or does any member of the public wish to address us on this item? 
Please approach the podium. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson, for honoring CEQA and making sure that it stays with us in this process because that is the intent of CEQA, that it is in place and that the alternatives are thoroughly examined before things are approved publicly. So thank you. I appreciate that very much. And I agree with you. I, um, I, I heard the presentation talk about putting cameras in hotspot. I remember that this board approved doing that um, a few years ago, uh, recently, within the last four or so. So I want to know if that was not done or if they were not effective or what happened because the board did approve using cameras in hotspots because of this dumping problem. I would like some information on um, some of the larger waste generators like the Santa Cruz County Fair that um, how how is it going with their composting? I, I volunteer there a lot and I know that there are the yellow bins, but I know that they're not being used very well. And so how is that transition going there as sort of a litmus test for this program in our county? Ms. Lababo does an excellent job, <laughs> and I really want to commend her. The county used to do cogeneration at the Buena Vista landfill with methane when I moved here in the 1980s. It stopped, and then I understood that it had begun again. So why is it not happening if it isn't happening? I would like to see a um, biodiesel uh, recycling plant from the plastics. I know there's a group that does that with ocean plastics that they've retrieved, and I'd like to see that. I would like dumpsters put at some of these places where dumping is a problem. So let's give them a place to put it. And I know it may, in, you could make the claim it, it doesn't pay dump fees, but it does address the problem. So Thank I think you, that Ms. would help. And I would also like, Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sally Christine Rogers, and my purpose today is to encourage Santa Cruz County to formally endorse the Trash Talkers initiatives. Trash is a human health issue, psychologically depleting and environmental hazard that adversely affects our agricultural sector, our businesses, washes into our watersheds, and ultimately ends up in our National Marine Sanctuary. Many organizations and governmental entities have been addressing this issue independently. However, there lacked coordination. Our goal was to get the right people into the room to learn what was already being done to create a strategic plan to come up with solutions, funding, ordinances, accountability, execution, and educational outreach. It has been an honor to help coordinate this group, which includes the Santa Cruz County Farm Bureau, Wetlands Watch, California Fish and Wildlife, County of Office of Education, Pajaro Valley Unified School District, Pajaro Valley Chamber, City of Watsonville, Caltrans, CHP, the County, Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Community Foundation, Santa Cruz County Public Works, the angels there, and um, the key staff of the offices of Assemblymember Robert Rivas, Senator John Laird, and Congressman Panetta. For the past year, we have met on a monthly basis. We've identified hotspots, coordinated cleanups, developed a mission statement, a bilingual logo, a website, and these groups are now working in an engaged, coordinated effort. In just one cleanup, for example, our lead, Ramon Gomez, who works for Mr. Caput, on Hazel Del Red, the Trash Talker volunteers picked up 4,000 cubic feet of debris, including 40 tires, two refrigerators, a stove, six mattresses, and a sofa. Trash is a massive challenge that affects all of us. However, as Trash Talkers has effectively shown when we work together and not adverse in adversity, uh, 
we can have a coordinated effort and we can achieve our goal, which is to make Santa Cruz the cleanest county in the state of California. Your support and endorsement is critical to this effort. And I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. All right, seeing anyone else here in chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, Chair, there are. Mary Lou, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Um, I don't have the numbers. The recycle only takes three out of all of those triangular numbers. They only take three of them and they do not take any sort of black plastics. So it's limited basically to glass water bottles, uh, metal cans, your whatever tide uh, comes in, those numbers, papers and such. So it's we're very limited in what gets recycled. Everything gets taken over to the San Jose Clara uh, sorting station and everything else goes to the dump. You put in smaller items, it clogs up the system and then they just throw the whole system out. So I'm hoping that they can come up with something similar to what is in uh, Utah. There was a lady who set up a, a um, recycle center there and they're able to uh, melt it down, recapture the uh, gasoline products and all that stuff for use. I would appreciate in consideration looking into that type of system for here. Much appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, very costly, all of this pollution, isn't it? I remember a bumper sticker, pollution is somebody's profit. And also corporations privatize the profit and they socialize the cost. So here we are in the county dealing with all the costs of this um, toxic waste that corporations are putting out. Why don't we stop the production of the pollution in the first place? We cannot keep running around trying to do the impossible. And your discussion of microplastics just now is indicative of that. They're everywhere. And I am looking right now at Zero Waste News, the county put out in the summer 2019 with a picture of people looking like they're in hazmat suits with hard hats, masks, uh, re trying to recycle. It's a horrible picture, and there's a quote in here. We really need to stop this where it starts. Here's a quote from your publication. In the June 9, 2019 Santa Cruz Sentinel article, levels of plastic pollution in Monterey Bay rival those in Great Pacific Garbage Patch, unquote. Paul Rogers explains the plastic pollution is made up of tiny bits of debris floating from near the surface to thousands of feet underwater. Ocean animals are consuming these particles. And it goes on. We're in big trouble. Allow Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Tara, your microphone is now available. Yes, thank you very much. I really appreciate the report from Director Machado and the person for the county that filled us in with all that information. What I am asking is I am very diligent about using my small green waste thing for compost. And I find that many of my neighbors are not as informed about what they can put in, in the green uh, bin and how to put it in the green bin and the blue bin. And I don't know everything. And I appreciate that you mentioned today again about plastics being clean and dry. I tell people that I do it, but many people don't understand the importance of that. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And education 
about how to do it is ought to be part of this program. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. How many more speakers do we have on Zoom? That's it. Okay, great. Um, well, we do have a 10 o'clock scheduled item that we're a little bit late for. So um, I know there's just a few more questions um, from Supervisor Coonerty on this item, um, but I'm gonna request that we just hold off, put a pause. I, I think we've reached, uh, we've put, put off our 10 o'clock item long enough. So I wanna um, take a pause on item seven here and we'll come back to it after the ceremony in a minute. And I will proceed with item 10, which is a proclamation uh, to consider authorizing the issuance of a proclamation honoring assembly member Mark Stone on his retirement to be signed by all members of the board as outlined in the memorandum of Chair Koenig. We'll begin with any comments from board members. Mr. Chair. Supervisor uh, McPherson. Thank you. A lot is can be said and will be said, and I know there's a, many members of the public that want to say this too, to uh, for the outstanding public service that my predecessor, predecessor as fifth district supervisor, Mark Stone, um, has what he has done for this community throughout the years. And uh, I'm just sorry, sorry to see him go uh, or leave, not go, but leave uh, his office, but uh, that's his decision. And uh, it, there comes a time for everything. Um, he's, um, th the interesting thing about uh, Assembly Member Stone is that his, focus has been so widespread, but it even started when he was a Scotts Valley School Board member. Uh, of course, when he got to the Ascendant, the 5th District Board of Supervisors, he was always concentrating uh, in particular on environmental issues and child care issues. He really wanted to make a better opportunity for our children in many, many ways. And then as chair of the Judiciary Committee, which is a, a really... Uh, highly regarded uh, committee in the, in the assembly. Uh, he, he oversaw that very, very well for years. Um, I can go on and on for a long time, but I know there's a lot of people that want to speak about the accomplishments and the appreciation for the public service of assembly member stone. And I really appreciate uh, your handing me an easy task. Yeah, I, I don't know if you knew the CZU fires were coming or COVID or whatever, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're getting through it. But uh, while he was here, he did a phenomenal job in Santa Cruz County. Uh, and he has done the same in the state of California as a, a distinguished assembly member. So I want to thank him for his service very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Yes. Supervisor Kappen. You bet. Uh, give credit where credit is due. I uh, want to thank you for uh, your cooperation and support for the Pajaro River project, which is very important to South County. Uh, that uh, Without that state money, we wouldn't be able to be going forward. And uh, that's going to be flood protection for 100 years. So if you're around 100 years from now, uh, you'll see how uh, how valuable your work was. And then uh, Watsonville Hospital is open. It's staying open. And uh, if we lost that uh, asset to South County, we'd be in big trouble. So that was state money that came through with your support and uh, others. And uh, I remember when I first was getting on the board uh, about 11 years ago, uh, there was this uh, project to buy a rail and trail uh, corridor. And uh, you and I believe uh, John Leopold went up to Sacramento. And uh, when you came back, uh, there was some state money and there was some other money in order to purchase it. So uh, for the past 11 years, we've been going back and forth uh, with uh, rail and trail, but now it's going forward. And uh, so there was uh, there was a lot of vision in that. Uh, I, I, I jumped on board, but it was uh, you and others that uh, uh, had the vision at the time. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Supervisor Friend. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Assemblymember Stone. I uh, would like to compliment you on the way that you have led and comported yourself as an elected official. I think that you are the rare elected official that uh, truly still believes in policy over politics and outcomes over optics. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, work pretty hard on the self-aggrandizement and you've never joined that world. You've just been interested in ensuring that the best things happen for Santa Cruz County and across the state. And in fact, uh, on the foster care work, for example, you, you've created some statewide changes that there'll be youth that will have uh, significantly better outcomes throughout their life as a result of the work that you diligently authored. Um, just on a personal note, your authenticity, your availability, uh, your transparency, you, you always made yourself available to myself and my staff. Um, and speaking of, of staff, you, you always hired remarkably talented staff. I mean, it, it says a lot about you for uh, not just the tenure that they stuck with you, but the quality that uh, that you had and the fact that some of them that have moved on have gone on to do exceptionally uh, important things. And I think that, that says a lot about who you are also as a manager and leader. Um, but I don't think it can be overstated enough uh, how much you respect the county and the county process coming from the county. I mean, I think that you, some of your success at the state has just been the fact that you came from a county government structure. You understood the needs of counties and, and what our relationship with the state is. When I first got on the board, you uh, emphasized to me the importance of, of developing relationships with county staff, having respectful relationships with county staff. I mean, you... Uh, you're just a you're just a class act, and 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 you have a, a a large public sector set of results behind you um, that that the world doesn't know because you've never been somebody that that needs to beat your chest and let them know that you did it. And I think that that's what's so admirable about you is is that you just care about these outcomes. And uh, I admire the work that you've done. I admire you as a person. Um, and and to Supervisor McPherson's point, well, I'm, I'm sad to see you go. Uh, as a state legislator, uh, I mean, I'm just really impressed with the body of work that you've been able to do both at the county and state level. And so I, I just want, want to know that this community is better off as a result of it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor uh, Kennedy. Yeah, thank you. Well, everything's been said, but not, not everyone said it. So uh, I will jump in here and uh, thank Assemblymember Stone for his service to our community and to the state as a whole. As was mentioned, um, he focused on populations that really didn't have a voice in the political process, whether it's uh, foster kids or our environment um, or just early early childhood or the the workings of our judicial system. And by focusing on those uh, systems, you've made real tangible improvements that will not that we not just see now, but we'll see for generations to come. I appreciate um, your staff, especially Marie, Marie McCarty, who's been uh, always willing to engage and reach out and do constituent work. Um, and I appreciate your approach to, um, to to government as a whole, where it's been about it's been about policy and it's been about principle. Um, and we've been lucky to have you. I know we uh, we have a very capable uh, likely replacement coming in. It will bring a lot of energy and engagement to the role. Um, but I want to thank you for your time and effort and service and um, hope this gives you more time for uh, long swims or uh, whatever new challenges that, uh, that, 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 that come up for you. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Assemblymember Stone, I just wanted to thank you for being a steadfast champion of the environment. And my colleagues have listed uh, many of your accomplishments over your tenure. And uh, but I want to remind you that even um, even things that maybe don't feel like an accomplishment for are are in fact successes. And your uh, repeated introduction of a cigarette butt ban in the, the state assembly, I, I know it didn't pass, but you know, it was the right thing to do. As someone who has picked up hundreds and if not thousands of butts off our beaches, and I'm sure you have too. It's just, it's it's so important. And it's, it's inspiring to have someone in the state assembly who will consistently uh, stand up for what's right and stand up for the environment. And you've inspired me and I'm sure another generation of leaders. So thank you. Well, and I'll open it for public comment. Anyone that wishes to say something about our assembly member, please approach the podium.
Well, I was hoping most of what I had to say would have been said by now, and it has. So I'd just like to talk about a very small micro chapter of one thing Mark did for our little neighborhood in Live Oak. And I'd like to just read it so I touch on all the points. One thing I'd like to talk about in our neighborhood in Live Oak is 19, in 2009, we created a small little working group of residents to help the county adopt what was called a vacation rental ordinance. After countless county hearings, the county approved the ordinance in 2010. The next step was the California Coastal Commission. The opponents of the vacation rental ordinance were well-funded and were able to hire influential lobbyists. Our little neighborhood group was really outmatched, but we went to the hearing in Marin County before the Coastal Commission, not knowing what was going to happen. A little bit of drama and our hearts were beating. Some of you may recall that Mark, and none of you have mentioned it, was also a member of the California Coastal Commission during his time here on the Board of Supervisors. We were hopeful of his support, but what happened at the hearing was beyond our expectations. As Mark does, and all of you have mentioned, he listened to every point of view during the hearing. Our little neighborhood group was lambasted by speaker after speaker. One even sang the national God Bless America and pointed to us. Anyhow, we sat through all of this. We had no clue what was going to happen. Then the hearing closed. And I'll always remember this. Within a few seconds, Mark leaned forward in his chair, made the motion for the Coastal Commission to approve the county's vacation rental ordinance. Within seconds, another member of the commission seconded the motion, and it passed unanimously. After a two-year process and somewhat of an ordeal. It was over in a flash. Our little neighborhood group sat there stunned. We felt like cheering, but we simply walked out quietly. Mark has made a difference in so many lives in Santa Cruz County and California. All I can think, say is thank you for your public service. Thank you. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. I'm Jack Dillis with the Scotts Valley City Council. And many things have said about been said about uh, Assembly Member Stone, and he's done tremendous things, as as you know. Um, and as a Scotts Valley City Council member, I'm particularly indebted to Mark for literally saving Scotts Valley public services in 2019. The uh, city was facing financial difficulties, and the governor had just vetoed a bill that would have allowed our voters to vote on increasing our sales tax. So Mark creatively uh, using out of the box ideas um, authored and carried through and supported um, a bill that allowed that provided some more flexibility, appeased the legislature and the governor and our that bill passed, became law. As a result, we were able to put our tax measure before the voters. So that made a huge difference in our community. And I'm very grateful for that. My favorite mark, celebratory story has to do with uh, when I saw him uh, in the recent Pride Parade in Santa Cruz, uh, he went where he was um, he was our uh, Grand Marshal, uh, sitting in a convertible sports car, wearing uh, a robe and a crown. And it was just fabulous. It was just, I got a kick out of that. And, and what, a, what a great thing to be doing. Um, thank you, Assembly Member Stone, for your leadership and for your protection of our vulnerable residents, our environment, and our city services. Enjoy your next chapter, whatever that may be. Thank you, Council Member Dulles. Good morning, board. Uh, my name's Dominic Dursa. I'm here on behalf of Assembly Member Robert Rivas uh, and his office. We just come to to share our our warm regards from uh, the Assembly Member from from Robert for all that Assembly Member Stone has been able to to do during his tenure, and certainly the support uh, that Robert has felt coming from Assembly Member Stone during his time in the legislature. I know he speaks often of his first year uh, in office when he was trying to move a bill forward on farm worker housing. The discussions and the support he received from Assemblymember Storm Stone meant so much in, in moving that bill forward. But I also want to say, as far as staff, you know, we look at what Assemblymember Stone did. A lot of his legislation this year, we talk about a staff unionization bill. People recognize that all of us who do the work daily, it was Assemblymember Stone who has been pushing for things like that, not just the environment not just for those most vulnerable like our foster youth, but we talk about IDs 
for undocumented residents so they don't feel left out when they're going to apply for services, submitting applications. It's things like a farm worker organizing bill that you literally saw people march 300 miles to help get passed. The legislation that Assemblymember Stone has pushed forward is nothing short of phenomenal. And I know as somebody who works here in our region, his staff has been equally amazing. From Maureen McCarty, Andrew Eberly, Alec Manis, Erica Parker, all of our staff have truly appreciated the team he's been able to put together because when we came in working for uh, uh, Assemblymember Rivas, they, they were the ones we had to often turn to, how do we do this? Uh, and they did it in the same manner that Assemblymember Stone did with dignity, with intelligence, and with true thought for their community. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Terza. Good morning. My name's John Laird, and um, I think that um, the first person that came to me and said you should run for the Senate uh, was Mark Stone. So I have been teasing him mercil mercilessly about the fact that I worked hard to do it, and then he bails. Uh, um, because that was one of the joys about the last two years is working uh, with him. And it's been almost 20 years ago. Uh, Jeff Almquist, who was a county supervisor, uh, Gray Davis was recalled. And the next morning, the next morning, he appoints Supervisor Almquist to the bench and creates a vacancy in the Board of Supervisors and a very key vacancy given the balance at the time. So I called the governor's office and they they said, uh, oh, you know, we don't think we're going to be here long enough to fill the vacancy. And I was apoplectic over a series of phone calls. Basically, you created this mess. You will fix this mess. And then they called me by the end of the week and said the transition is going to take a while and we should have time to do it. And then I thought, me and my big mouth, I've been doing this and I never had a candidate. Uh, uh, and there were three outstanding people that put themselves forward. But if you talk to Mark, he's one of those rare people in politics that every time you talk to him, he goes up in your estimation. Uh, uh, sometimes the first time you meet people is the, the high point and uh, uh, not with Mark. Uh, he really has done that. And, and one of the interesting things is, is people in Sacramento will know we're from the same area and they'll say, mm, tell me something I don't know about Mark. And I'll say he swam the English Channel and they will genuinely be surprised, but actually attribute it to him. And I have great glee at the end of that story and saying, I've been an elected official over 40 years in Santa Cruz County, and I never had my photograph in the Sentinel in a Speedo, <laughs> which happened to Mark after that. And, and I think the, the uh, and it has come up in these comments, the, the thing, we all know him and love him and see what he does for Santa Cruz County. But as somebody that saw him up close in Sacramento, uh, foster kids, he chaired the environmental caucus, uh, people went to him on key bills. And when I had a tough bill in the assembly, I genuinely went to Mark. Last year, we made a historic change in pain and suffering benefits after 60 years. And Mark was chair of the Judiciary Committee. He guided it out of committee. Uh, that bill ended up making it off the, the assembly floor with him presenting it and the governor signing it. And it was a historic change. So people that were uh, um, losing their right of action because of COVID uh, uh, and people waiting them out gained that right back. And it's something that Mark just putting his nose to the grindstone uh, made happen. And I can't tell you the number of times in this year since Mark made his announcement that people have said to me in Sacramento, what are we going to do without him on and fill in the blank? Whether it's coastal issues and his coastal commission experience, whether it's health and human services and his former chairmanship and everything he did, or whether it's on judiciary and basic civil rights and uh, judicial processes. And so it has just been an amazing career. And I think we are very lucky uh, to have had him as our assembly member. And even though 
um, he is supporting somebody that uh, uh, if she gets there, will have big shoes to fill and have a real bar to cross over. I, I think he's supporting her. And she's really capable of it, but he will just truly be missed. Thank you, Senator Laird. Hello, my name is Gail Pellerin, and I've had the pleasure of living in all the districts that Mark Stone has represented from the school district to the fifth district supervisors to now the assembly district. And it has been an honor and a pleasure working with him over these years. He is definitely a man of integrity. He is a legend. Uh, the work he's done in judiciary and foster kids and the environment is exemplary. And, um, and I've had the pleasure of getting to know a lot of his colleagues colleagues in Sacramento, and they all say amazing things about Mark Stone, just that he is a policy wonk, that he is someone that you can count on. He's a man of his word. He's got great integrity. Um, certainly just just such a pleasure and um, getting to know him through the eyes of other people who worked with him. And um, he's just incredible. He's been an incredible leader for our community. And whoever fills those big shoes that he is leaving behind, I hope you will answer their call whenever they call for advice and, and help along the way. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Ms. Pellerin. Good morning, board members. Uh, Fernando Geraldo, Chief of Probation. I just want to say a few words in appreciation of Assembly Member Stone. Um, he's had a significant impact on our juvenile justice system. I know very well. And on behalf of California's youth and families, adults, uh, and my department in the field of probation, I want to thank him for sponsoring so many bills that have transformed how we work and created much better outcomes for those we serve. He's clearly listened to youth and families, advocates, the communities, probation chiefs, the, the entire state to make these improvements to how he works. So it, the landscape of our justice system is forever changed. I want to share a message from Karen Pank, who's the executive director of our association, Chief Probation Officers of California. And this is what she said. CPOP has worked closely with Assemblymember Mark Stone over the years and partnered on many important issues, including continuum of care reform, the transitional age youth pilot prog program, juvenile restoration of competency issues, and a pilot program for children's crisis continuum services. CPOC recognized Assemblymember Stone for his legislative leadership on these issues as a legislator of the year in 2018. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Geraldo. Good morning, I'm Nancy Macy. I live in Boulder Creek and have had the extreme pleasure of introducing Mark a lot of times because he has faithfully returned to the San Lorenzo Valley <laughs> to speak at the Environmental Town Hall, which is an which is a annual a project of the Valley Women's Club. It was on Zoom the last time. And <clears throat> Mark has come and faithfully given a report on what's happening at the state level and how it impacts us. Us meaning in the San Lorenzo Valley, but obviously Santa Cruz County and so on. And everyone who came, and it was usually a Saturday afternoon, a sunny Saturday afternoon, and there were usually 150 people there. And that's a big turnout for our little valley, especially on a Saturday afternoon. So we were always very honored for him to be there. And he always, people left saying, I didn't know that's how it worked in, San, in Sacramento. He would give insights into how it worked. It was very helpful. He also came when the uh, AmeriCorps kids, I call them kids, they were young people from across the United States, came as a part of a program to do restoration work uh, in the San Lorenzo Valley. And he came and they had never been honored quite in the same way because he gave them recognition from the state of California, a, a, a beautiful acknowledgement of what they had done for our community and they were it was like wow I, this is really cool i've been this state of california you know it's really fancy it's got the logo and everything on it so that was really special but the thing that strikes me as you make an introduction for someone is you have to do a little research to find out what they've been doing and every single year it was like oh my god he's done so much and the thing that people have learned in working with Mark is 
he has empathy and he has a creative mind that comes up with solutions. As you mentioned, uh, Chair Koenig, the uh, uh, cigarette butts. Who knew that you could even come up with the idea of banning cigarette butts, number one. And number two, what a huge solution it would be to a horrific problem if we didn't even have to pick them all up. So that's the type of thing. And also the creative work that he did Thank for you, uh, uh, the queer youth. I wanted to mention that one too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dana McCrae. And Jason Heath will never admit this, but county councils don't always welcome attorneys joining the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> it can be a difficult relationship. But Mark's first day in office, he came to introduce himself to me and said, I can't wait to be a client. So excited to be on the other side of the table. And I thought to myself, well, we'll just see about that. He was true to his word, as he always is. And he was such a gentleman, which isn't to say he disagreed with everything that the office did. But if he knew that we were working on something difficult that he had expertise in, he would send an article or say, have you thought about this? And frankly, he just made us better lawyers, just in his quiet, honorable way. But as many people have said here, I think Mark's legacy is what he's done for young people. From his early days in office on a school board to his work on child welfare uh, system improvement planning here at the county. And then obviously with um, you know the foster care reform uh, that he did. Um, the only mistake I ever made with Mark was telling him I would say yes to anything he ever asked me to do. And that's how I ended up peddling with him from San Francisco to Los Angeles on the aid cycle. And I guess I should thank him for that, but I'm, the jury's still out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. McRae. My name is Stuart Rosenstein, and I've been lucky enough to work on LGBTQIA issues, helping queer and trans youth. And I've been working with Mark for many, many years. I have many stories to share, and it's very humbling hearing about all the other work that he has done, uh, but specifically to help gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender and uh, and an allied youth in Santa Cruz County. He's done many things and he's been so humble throughout the whole experience. We had a horrific situation happen in his district uh, some years ago and to calm the, the flames, uh, he wrote beautiful op-ed uh, uh, articles in the Sentinel that helped diffuse the situation. And he's just very humble when you thank him. He just wants to help people. Um, one of my favorite stories uh, of Mark is uh, we have an annual Queer Youth Leadership Awards, and we happen to have had it at Scotts Valley High School one year. And he was in the back where I always stay in the back. And Mark Stone looked at me and was hearing all the LGBT youth giving their speeches. And Mark said, we need to get these kids connected to political issues. I want to sponsor a table to get them to one of the largest political LGBT dinners in San Jose and get them at a young age to be inspired to do more. And those kids now are in their 20s and 30s and doing great work. And they often will tell me, they will forget the name of the event, but they'll say, oh, that dinner was amazing. That I didn't know the LGBT people were respected in that way. And, um, and, and Mark has just been so humble. Whenever I bring them to the table, take a picture. Um, it's just the kids have so much joy. What really inspires, though, is the parents and grandparents. When they hear that Mark is so supportive, it's just love and they get emotional when they thank me to thank Mark. Um, I want to give a shout out to Mark's team. Mark's team is equally passionate to him. And during the pandemic, when I would call Maureen or Tish or anyone in his office, you could hear the emotion on the phone. They cared about each person and they were working so hard to help people. I'm very honored to be part of the people. Thank you, Mark Stone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenstein. Uh, my name is Les Gardner, and uh, I wanted to, uh, the last gentleman, I wanted to add something to that. Uh, when Mark was 
first appointed to the board, he had to run for office right away. And nobody knew him. Uh, and there was five people in the race. Two were city council members uh, that were much more well-known. And it was a very tough race. And early on, I had told Mark, I said, you know, we've got to get at least 41% in Scotts Valley. And the last gentleman was talking about an incident there. There had been a lot of bullying in, in, the, uh, in the schools there. This is 20 years ago, and it was much more conservative uh, city at that time. And it was they wanted to bring some uh, speakers in. Uh, to address that from the gay community. And uh, the school board had asked Mark to weigh in on it. Now, he didn't have to. Uh, he was on the board of supervisors. It was a school board and a city issue. And him and I talked about this. And I said, you know, you don't have to do that. And it's going to be very controversial. And it's going to cost you. Mark said, I don't care. He hadn't been in that job 30 days, but he said, I don't care. He said, it's the right thing to do. And I don't care what it costs me. I'm going to do it. And he did. And uh, we, you know, we certainly won that race. But for us that were working on the campaign, uh, it, it showed what the make of that man was. And for 20 years, I've been close to Mark for 20 years. It's always been that way. Uh, it has always been the issue, what's the right thing to do, not what is the political right thing to do, but what's the right thing to do for my, my constituents and what's the right thing to do, basically what's my moral compass. Uh, and he's never, never uh, uh, varied on that. Uh, he's never even uh, abstained from a vote. Uh, he might be the only guy, but uh, he always votes. Uh, one other thing, I just want to address one thing that John said about the uh, swimming the English Channel. John and I uh, went to Monterey to um, meet with Speaker Bass at the time to uh, talk to her about... Um, uh, appointing Mark Stone to the Coastal Commission. And uh, when we got in front of her, there was a lot of people in the room that were actually in favor of another candidate uh, uh, that, that was on the Coastal Commission at that time. But the first thing out of John's mouth is, you know, he swam the Coastal Commission. He swam the, uh, he swam the, he swam the English Channel. And uh, 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 not, not that it was a good environment or anything else, but, but he swam the English Channel. And I swear, uh, she, it was, she was taken back. And we spent about five minutes talking about um, his swimming the English Channel. And, and, and I, I swear that that must have been one of the things that, that pushed him over on this deal. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. All right, seeing no one else here in chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, we have one speaker. Call in user one, your microphone is available. Marilyn Garris, hello everybody. I would like to see you in person like I used to, but I feel pretty ill with all the wireless microwave radiation there. Uh, something Mark uh, accomplished along with Ellen Peary when they were on the board has not been mentioned yet. The county, and this took five years of effort to get it stopped, used to spray for weeds, they said, all the roads in the county with Roundup. And you see this swath of death along the roads. Um, San Lorenzo Valley Women's Club was one of the groups that called for a halt of this. Kevin Collins, I remember, Central Water District, members of the community signed petitions. And finally, Ellen Peary and Mark Stone adopted a policy that aim for, I think it was zero pesticide use, but they stopped the spraying of the carcinogenic Roundup. And that is one thing I think is very important and commendable. When Mark was on the Coastal Commission, However, he led the move to put Verizon 4G antennas on the coast. And this is very detrimental to nature and everybody, microwave radiation. So with some policies, they're commendable. Other ones are harmful to the environment like this. 
I do want to give high praise to Maureen McCarty. She's been most helpful over the years, and without staff, we know the elected officials would be unable to accomplish <laughs> hardly anything. So thanks to Maureen. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Carrot. We have one more speaker. Tara, your microphone is now available. Thank you, Chairman and Board of Supervisors. I just want to say you've all said everything that I would agree with about Mark, the fact that he's real. He accepted my friend request. When I see him in the world, he acknowledges me. I've lived in Santa Cruz County for 22 years. I've lived in Pleasure Point for 20 of those years. And I've done what I've done, but Mark is the one that has been out there. And I just say thank you for all your service. I'm excited that you're going to be able to continue to swim and um, possibly you swim across the bay to Monterey. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. We have no more speakers. All right. Well, this time I'd like to invite up Assemblymember Stone to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members. And I think I'd like to take this opportunity really to say thank you to you and to everyone who's been a part of my career. It's been almost 25 years between school board, board of supervisors, coastal commission, and now the, the legislature. And I, I just can't say not how much I appreciate the, the voters' willingness to keep sending me back to Sacramento or into the, these various roles and, and the patience that, that they have had, the confidence that the voters have had in me, Scotts Valley, Santa Cruz County, especially the 5th District and in the 29th Assembly District. That's been, it's been an honor absolutely to serve. But I also want to thank mostly the, the staff who I've been able to interact with and whether it's staff at the school district, staff in the county, and every, as you know, supervisors sort of show up from time to time and county staff just has to keep soldiering on with whomever shows up and whatever issues we happen to bring. But in this county, specifically being able to meet with staff and get to know the departments and how things function and what the history is, was really remarkable. And every staff member here was so willing to sit down and explain and, and talk through and be patient sometimes with the initiatives that, that we ultimately bring forward. Uh, we're not always, I say this of myself, the best and the brightest. We're the ones who get elected. And because of that, we have to rely on staff. And this county is absolutely remarkable in what gets done. I, I think my colleagues in the state probably get very frustrated with me talking about as, as they talk about what can and can't get done this, throughout the state. And I think I can be really irritating when I say, well, yes, but in Santa Cruz County, because we can do, we have done, and we will continue to do. That's the way that Santa Cruz County can work. And it should, it's a small enough county. It should really be able to work that well. So I appreciate it, all the different levels, the staff uh, who I've been able to work with. And on my personal staff, and with this, I'm gonna include my committee staff in the legislature, but the, the staff that I, who I've had here, and especially all my chiefs of staff, almost 20 years worth, whether it's Susan or Maureen, Rebecca, Craig, Aaron, who have put together uh, really a, a functioning team and the way that, that we've been able to work and work effectively by having the right people in the right places. Allison and Maisha, Maisha was chief consultant for human services for two years with me and Allison has been eight years judiciary chief counsel. And it's been absolutely remarkable working with folks who have helped guided and provide pathways and understanding to what we need to be working on. And Maureen's been mentioned here. Maureen's been with me since I was on the board here and now with my district director. And so for all of those folks, uh, the mistakes that I should have made, could have made, would have made, but didn't make because of them, I probably couldn't 
even begin to list at this point. I think the smartest thing any of us can do when we get in an elected position is to put good people in place, listen to them, let them do their jobs and make sure that, that they are empowered to do the best work that they possibly can. It's one of the reasons we focus on constituent services here because we have a very active constituency. I think my district office here when I'm in the legislature gets more calls in a day than most of my colleagues get in a week, sometimes a month, because this is a very engaged constituency and we are all blessed, whether you know it or not, elected officials, we are blessed to have a constituency that, it, that empowered, that engaged, that active in what we're doing. They hold us accountable. They make sure we're doing what we are supposed to be doing. So I can't thank my staff in all its components enough for working with me, for teaching me, for allowing me to do the work that, that we've been able to accomplish. I just want to do a shout out to Les Gardner as well, who's been a mentor, and a friend and a confidant to me for years. And bless, I know I've pissed you off a few times, uh, but I hope I've made you proud. I don't think I've ever embarrassed you. I am, at least I hope not through all of these years. And then to my family, my kids, Melissa and Byron, who your families is, those of you in these positions know, give up a lot when we take these roles because we're not there all the time. We're not always able to be there as much as we try for them every single time. But my kids have appreciated what I've done and they have supported me. And then finally, my wife, Kathy, and that's an applause line. Anyone in public service knows you have to give up somewhere and having a, a spouse, a partner at home to pick up the slack to do the things that you're not able to do. We could not do these roles without that kind of support and help at home. So Kathy, I wanna say thank you. What, whatever accolades people wanna lay on me is really to my staff, is really to my family for letting me be a part of this. And it's been a remarkable career of almost 25 years altogether, five years in Scotts Valley on the school board, nine years here at this dais and 10 years in the legislature now, which believe me is plenty. Uh, I look forward to Gail. I'm very excited to be supporting the, the next person to take my role. And I have every confidence that it will be Gail. And that'll you, allow all of you to sort of let me fade into the background and and be forgotten because of the work that 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 she will be doing that I have every confidence. So thank you. I, I appreciate your acknowledgement. I appreciate the acknowledgement of the, the work that's been done, the staff that I've been able to put together and work with over the years. And just being able to work in this environment is really, truly an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assemblymember Stone. And now I have a very nice proclamation for you here. If I could just get a vote by the board to officially issue this proclamation or a motion. Second. Motion by Supervisor McPherson and a second by Supervisor Caput. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Item passes unanimously. Thank you.
right, the board will now recess for five minutes and then we'll return to item seven. Thank you. Considering a report on recycling and solid waste long-term planning progress. Uh, first clerk, we please call the roll. Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Oh, he's not here. <laughs> McPherson and Koenig? Here. All right, thank you. And please uh, make a note when Supervisor Caput rejoins us. Supervisor Coonerty, I think you had some questions you wanted to ask. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question was, uh, it mentioned in the staff report that um, staff would initiate a renegotiation of small hauler contracts and only issue temporary um, permits or rights to, to engage in that activity. I know we expanded um, pickups with the green waste contract, but do you have any idea how many people we're talking about that still use these small hauler contracts and has the outreach been done? Um, just the, all the questions around that issue. I know it's been a, I know it's been an issue in other districts recently, and I want to make sure um, we're not stepping into a new controversy here. So uh, recently one of our smaller haulers that had been grandfathered in just to operate in the San Lorenzo Valley summit area, uh, to specifically um, serve residents that were in, on private roads, long private roads off, off the main county maintained roads. Um, that franchise uh, E um, was failing to abide by the agreement and not making reports and payments to the county. So we, we unfortunately had to terminate them. Um, a lot of those customers uh, uh, were able to go to Green Waste because Green Waste was able to get a smaller truck that could serve them. Um, some of those customers went to our other uh, small hauler franchise, uh, Summit Trash or Summit Waste and Recycling Services. Um, this is kind of a, an issue where we're reaching out to those affected, the former Coons customers, um, uh, assuring them that they need to get garbage service per our universal service ordinance and that uh, green waste recovery uh, is the primary hauler. They're the exclusive franchise. And um, um, green waste has assured us that they can, with the smaller truck, access all those private roads. So um, I, I know there's more outreach and education and um, communication needed, but um, you know we are working on that. So do we know how many potential affected customers we're talking about here? There were 300, uh, 300 to 350 uh, affected customers. And to my knowledge, most of them have either uh, gone with green waste recovery, some have gone with the other small hauler, and some have opted to do the um, self hauler option, become a registered self hauler where they haul their garbage and recyclables to the county disposal sites themselves. And, th but this is, I mean, I, I know that's around this one issue, but but it mentions in the report that that we're sort of going to be taking a renegotiating all the contracts. Is is it just 350 countywide that we're talking about, or is is there a potential for more impacts down the road? The approximately 350 were just in the summit area, the San Lorenzo Valley area. Um, so. If we, so, I mean, if so, if we move towards, uh, I guess, if we move towards limiting these uh, these haulers, small haulers, to just temporary, do we know how many people are are affected? Will be affected? If I could chime in on this one as well. Um, so, I think uh, what Supervisor Coonerty is referencing are the Nero haulers, which are our commercial uh, suppliers. So Casey, maybe uh, you could share if you know how many um, people use the the Nero haulers and and what those anticipated changes are coming forward potentially. Uh, correct. So the, we have non-exclusive roll-off franchises. Those are for uh, containers that are greater than ten cubic yards or ten cubic yards and greater. Um, there is, I think, seven. Um, uh, authorized, you know, county-approved Nero haulers that have franchise agreements. Um, 
we've been, you know, those have been renewed. We're renewing them. We need to renew them again. They expire at the end of this uh, calendar year. And um, we are going to include provisions. Uh, you know, we've always had requirements for them to recycle, uh, you know, both, uh, you know, mixed recyclables and organics. Um, we are going to uh, be working with them and, and, and auditing them and their customers to make sure they're complying with that. Um, not all of them can provide, you know, smaller sized uh, recyclable service for organics and, and, you know, mixed recyclables, but our, our exclusive franchise with Green Waste Recovery can supply those smaller bins that may be needed at many of the commercial generators, um, you know, to make sure they have adequate recycling service. Supervisor Coonerty, if I may add on to that, um, I think we understand your concern and we have a similar concern at having lived through the, the Coons transition. And so we will strive to gather more details, more information, do more outreach before there are any proposed changes, uh, because we understand that if, if we impact those uh, roll off um, customers, it'll impact our uh, constituents as well. And so uh, we'll, we hear you, I th and I think we're hearing you correctly that we'd like to, you know, a bit of time to gather up the numbers on the users of those uh, roll-off bins. Those are the larger bins, but it's a similar similar situation uh, with trying to get those, those roll-off bin uh, small haulers compliant with uh, 1383 and the other requirements that, that we have to meet. So we will do outreach and, and data gathering and, and make sure that the impacted areas are knowledgeable before any changes occur. Okay, and thank you. It'd be helpful to know, you know, um, to try to, I, it's hard to know exactly how big an impact this is. And, and then also maybe by supervisorial district, we all understand which communities specifically might be impacted so we can have a sense of who we need to be in conversation with and, and check in with before any changes are made. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. So we had heard from the public on this, so at this time, a motion would be appropriate. Uh, Mr. Chair, I hadn't quite, I'm sorry, um, I hadn't quite actually fully addressed the questions before we got cut off last time. I mean, I appreciate uh, the expediency of it, but just getting back to the issue that I want to make sure that Supervisor McPherson's issue is addressed. That's important to me. I also want to recognize what the item actually is, which is functionally just a progress report. And so I, I, I feel like there's, as opposed to not accepting the progress report, there's a way to accept the progress report, but provide additional direction that addresses what he needs. Because I just, I feel like this is from a procedural standpoint, there's no reason today to not accept the recommended actions. And so I, I would be comfortable, but I, I wanna make sure Supervisor McPherson agrees with this or is comfortable with this, that the additional direction would be that they would come back uh, with, uh, addition, with the CEQA documents and alternatives and bring them forward as part of the next steps for project development. And I say that because those need to be brought back when the projects are considered anyway, but we can specify that we want that to come back as part of the project development. I just don't see why we wouldn't accept uh, the other elements of the zero waste report or their standard uh, progress report that they also could be using as part of their justification for funding solicitations at this time uh, and sort of punted into some um, unclear time into the first quarter when the clear thing that I think Supervisor McPherson is asking for is ensuring that he has a full analysis on, on, on what the alternatives would be should these projects come forward. And I think that's just something we can add in additional direction. But Supervisor McPherson, what do you think of that? Well, I think that would be acceptable. I mean, if, if it's clear, and I think it can be made clear, I, I got a nod from the county council that this would be acceptable. So I would I would uh, go along with that to accept the recommended actions, the three of the recommended actions um, with the stipulation that we come back uh, in, the, in the near future, early next year, uh, to uh, report further information on the sequel alternatives. I'll second. All right, we have a motion by Supervisor McPherson, a second by Supervisor Friend. If Any we can make a comment. Certainly. Before Supervisor the, Cabot. Yeah, I, I want to thank you and your staff for uh, uh, the help in the past uh, two years uh, with uh, cleanup of uh, trash and uh, homeless encampments uh, that we've had in South County. That would be uh, Murphy Crossing. Uh, area, uh, Highway 152 and Houlihan, uh, Hazeldale Road cleanup, 
and also Airport Boulevard uh, near Green Valley uh, area. And then, uh, so I wanna thank you and uh, Public Works. Uh, we, uh, we do have one scheduled, I guess, for Paulson Road, and the staging area will be the property where we have a lease with a option to buy uh, a South County Park. And uh, which is on Whiting Road. So anyway, I want to thank you and your staff. And the last thing I want to say, I love the name of the initiative, Trash Talkers. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Any further discussion? All right, then we have the motion to adopt the recommended actions with additional direction to return in the early part of next year with a review of the CEQA alternatives. Very good. All right, clerk, uh, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Item passes as amended. Thank you. Thank you uh, to our entire staff on that last item. We'll now proceed with item eight which is to consider a presentation on the six cycle housing element update program and direct staff to return on or before January 31st, 2023 for an additional study session as outlined in the memorandum of the deputy CAO, director of community development and infrastructure. And for a report on this item, we have our assistant director of planning, Stephanie Hansen. Good morning. I think it's still morning. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Koenig, uh, members of the uh, board supervisors, we're going to um, uh, discuss today our upcoming six cycle uh, housing element update. Uh, the housing element is one of seven elements in the general plan. Actually, there's eight, but the new sustainability update work will combine two of them. Um, and one of seven uh, mandated elements, and it is on an eight-year update cycle. The previous um, housing element, the fifth cycle, was adopted um, and certified by the California Department of Community Development, or HCD, in 2016. Um, several of the uh, elements on this slide will be updated, however, in the sustainability update, which you'll start to review at your next meeting. And then um, the last two elements of public safety and noise elements were recently updated um, uh, as part of our safety element update. Uh, this slide shows goals associated with the update. Um, we included a sixth goal here because there's new requirements associated with the sixth cycle that are of paramount importance. Um, these goals include providing a range of housing choices, removing barriers to providing housing, preserving housing stock, and providing opportunities for special needs and supportive housing. Goal number two is specific to assisting in the development of adequate housing to meet the needs of extremely low, low and moderate income households. A new goal for the sixth cycle is to focus on future housing in areas with high resources. Um, these include areas that have good access to transit, schools, jobs, parks, and other services, sites that do not require environmental mitigation, um, and where the presence of streamlining um, uh, for permitting is available. Uh, here are some of the required actions associated with the update. First, the county will start by reviewing our fifth cycle housing inventory. This will require that we do a thorough analysis of the existing um, a thousand plus or so properties that were in the last um, inventory in the fifth cycle housing element. And those properties that remain vacant can be included in our next one, um, the sixth cycle inventory. But on the other hand, those were developed during the fifth cycle will have to be reevaluated to see if there's additional um, capacity for inclusion in the next cycle. 
Staff will identify those any properties that were overlooked or subdivided um, and may provide additional um, housing sites. HCD requires that only sites with realistic demonstrated potential for development during the planning period can be included in the housing inventory must identify uh, utility infrastructure and other services and specify the number of units and the level of income that the units can accommodate on a property. Um, county staff will review density of projects on similarly zoned sites for affordability levels as part of this project. Um, with some uh, exceptions, vacant sites that were included in our last two uh, housing cycles will not be able to be included in the six cycle housing. So that may um, put some constraints on how much we can use our existing inventory and may, um, you know, encourage or force the county into engaging in rezoning of specific sites to accommodate higher densities after the housing element is adopted. <laughs> The Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, or AMBAG, has just approved the RENA plan for our region. RENA stands for Regional Housing Needs Allocation. Our county was assigned uh, a RENA of 6, 4,634 units to be accommodated in the eight-year planning period. This slide shows a comparison between the fifth cycle RENA and the new sixth cycle RENA. Our arena has increased over three and a half times from the last cycle, so it's quite a huge jump for us. As of 2021, 744 units have been permitted under the current arena, which represents about 56% of the required units. This year will be a decent year for us in terms of residential building permits, and so this percentage will be improved by the end of the cycle. Oops, need to go back. Okay. Um, affirmatively furthering fair housing is a new uh, six cycle requirement. We call it AFFH because it's a mouthful. It means taking meaningful actions in addition to combating discrimination that overcome patterns of segregation and fosters inclusive communities free from barriers that restrict access to opportunity. Uh, we do this in part by uh, performing an assessment of fair housing, which requires an analysis of the relationship between available sites in our high resource areas and creating um, policies and programs to address this, as well as rezoning of sites. The purpose of the assessment is to replace segregated living patterns with integrated and balanced living patterns, to transform racially and ethnically concentrated areas um, and areas of poverty into areas of opportunity. The assessment of fair housing will include a summary of housing issues in the jurisdiction and an assessment of the jurisdiction's fair housing enforcement and outreach capacity and an analysis of summary of fair housing issues used to um, using available state and local and federal resources. The analysis will include a variety of factors such as trends and patterns within our, look, our uh, county and in comparison to the broader region. And specifically, we'll be addressing integration and segregation, racially or ethnically concentrated areas of poverty, disparities in access to opportunity, including for persons with disabilities, and disproportionate housing needs, um, which may include things like overpayment, overcrowding, housing conditions, um, and, and the like. As noted, uh, public involvement has to be robust in this program and will begin to occur early in the process. Staff is putting together lists of potential stakeholders who may have an interest in the development of housing in the county, including nonprofit housing developers, local developers, realtors, funders, farm labor organizations, community-based organizations, others addressing homelessness or houselessness and uh, interested county departments. Staff will be using similar outreach methods developed for the sustainability update, including an interactive website, 
public comment portal, outreach via social media and publicized community meetings. It's important to note that a lot of the work that we're doing this year provides a good foundation for the housing element update. Both the sustainability update and the climate action and adaptation plan contain policies and strategies that support infill housing and housing options in the context of a changing environment. Policy and code changes in the sustainability update, which will be particularly useful, include accommodating infill development along our transportation corridors and in urban areas with services, broadening the range of densities allowed in our current zone districts, facilitating new standards for smaller lots, raising the percentage of residential development that can be used on mixed use sites, allowing slightly taller buildings and adjustments to floor area ratios that recognize the need for more housing and um, better utilization of sites, right sizing parking requirements and requiring transportation demand management strategies to encourage reduction in vehicle travel, providing easy to follow county design guidelines to address neighborhood transitions and goals for vibrant communities. And finally, adopting a new higher density zoning district called residential flex, which will allow 45 units to the acre. Um, which will accommodate smaller housing units for singles, students, workers, retirees, and others. Rezoning properties along our transportation corridors, including the rail corridor, will likely be a next step to improve our housing Im inventory and accommodate our arena. So here's uh, the schedule we have for the proposed update. We'll begin with assessing the housing inventory and doing the AFFH analyses. Um, as noted in staff report, staff also intends to return to the board again in January with an update to engage our new supervisors. Environmental review is required and will be um, anticipated to be completed by the uh, by June of next year. Stakeholder input will start soon beginning this year and will continue along with community meetings along the way. We'll present a draft of the element to the Planning Commission, Housing Advisory Commission, and Board of Supervisors next summer, um, and then submit our uh, draft to HCD. After that, we'll return for adoption by the end of the year. Um, the board also directed staff to apply for pro-housing designation offered by HCD, which improves our um, counties and housing developers' chances of receiving funds from state resources. After the housing element is adopted, the county would work to achieve the status and has three years to rezone properties needed to improve the inventory and accommodate the arena so long as we stay on our schedule. So that uh, concludes today's uh, presentation. We're happy to receive any input the supervisors may have to help guide and inform the program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Are there questions or comments from members of the board? Uh, Mr. Chair, <laughs> Supervisor McPherson. There have been challenges of our housing uh, element here, and there's never bigger than we are facing with this uh, proposal, and it's no fault of the planning department, for sure. Um, I want to thank the planning department and our community development and infrastructure for the, its work on uh, and their, the other commissions, too, on their input uh, in this housing element that they've made to date. We all know it's going to be a huge challenge, um, bigger than ever, uh, to meet the new arena numbers for our county, even more so than in years past. I mean, when you look at, we had from the last arena segment, and this one, uh, what goes through 2020, I think it was 24, 20. or excuse me, 20, excuse me, 31, 2023 to 31. Um, the last one was, um, 1300 units and we just got over half of those built and now they've they've tr more than tripled with our limitations in infrastructure water sewage transportation and power um this is going to be interesting to see how we can meet this challenge i it's overwhelming um and <clears throat> again this is no no putting blame on the the planning or public works or any other department but um I guess my my comment is uh, let's get real, um, but uh, with our topography, what we have, and some of the challenges that we have, 
Well, we're working on these modifications and other tools uh, that's going to hopefully lead to more units. We know we have a housing crisis here. And as we do throughout the state and, and many, many other places as well, we know there the barriers that I've just mentioned, not to mention uh, before, the market conditions, neighborhood compatibility, traffic, um, and also, of course, is the concern of the lack of resources from the state to meet the numbers. Uh, I'm going to be attending the California State Association of Counties annual conference in a couple of weeks uh, where housing is going to be a huge topic down there. I can guarantee you that each of the 58 counties in this state are really concerned about this demand that the state is putting on the counties. Um, <clears throat> can I ask you, do you know that do you anticipate more state funding sources and or state enforcement uh, on meeting these arena numbers? What's your general thought of how much are they going to put the hammer to us? <laughs> um, there's there's a bit of a hammer associated with ha having our housing element updated in time. Um, you can uh, the state can come down on you if you don't. They can impose fines. Um, I think for those who are egregious, they even have other actions that they could take, such as uh, ruling your whole general plan to be out of compliance and taking over permitting. So there's threats out there. Um, I think the biggest threat that I can see is that um, having a compliant housing element is often tied to um, state funding and grants, both for housing projects and transportation. Uh, so it's very important that we try to stay on schedule. Have not heard of um, this. Actually, the state can come down on you for not implementing what's in the housing element, but I think there has to be an understanding at the state level that we are not housing developers per se. Um, certainly, there's other issues in that drive the market, such as um, interest rates right. for one thing, construction <laughs> costs, et cetera. So. Yeah, well, there's um, it's going to be interesting to hear uh, as we go along. And uh, I just, uh, I, there's some ideas that I have. Uh, I want to hear what other board members have to say, but uh, <clears throat> this is certainly the biggest challenge uh, we can have related to our housing infrastructure in Santa Cruz County for sure. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you. Supervisor okay. Caput. Good. Okay. Give everybody else a chance if you want to yeah. jump in before me or go ahead, Supervisor Cabot. If you okay, thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I uh, we definitely need uh, very low and low income housing, and uh, I just want to say, uh, in the past, uh, we've been spreading it out. And I want to see it, uh, I would like to see it uh, continue to be spread out throughout District 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, uh, not uh, concentrated uh, only in uh, South County. Uh, the other is, is uh, when we have a new development coming in, uh, can we require uh, permeable uh, asphalt and cement, especially for the parking areas and uh, sidewalks? Uh, because uh, that way the water will run back into the ground rather than running off and, uh, you know, going into the uh, ocean eventually. I guess I'm not prepared to answer that question. They would have to meet the standards that are in place, but I'll, we certainly can um, communicate that comment to to our development review and our public works folks. Yeah. yeah can we make it a requirement? that uh, I, I know in the uh, uh, mental health uh, facility that went in in Watsonville, that's all permeable uh, parking and also uh, sidewalks, so. I don't know we would address that in the housing element update, which is all about encouraging housing, not uh, putting additional requirements in, but there's certainly um, some overlap in doing it in a, um, in a fashion that meets our environmental goals as well. And I yeah. have and Matt behind me, so I'll let him address that. And this would be related to it, requiring more trees to be planted. 
uh, for shade, uh, especially in parking areas. And uh, uh, anyway, shade is a big deal, along with uh, water runoff. Hi. Good morning. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, just a little comment on, on your question there with regard to design criteria for stormwater. Uh, we offer a lot of different options, in, but we do defer to the developer or the, the builder to choose the best option that fits their site. Every site's a little bit different. Uh, we do see a lot of uh, pervious materials being used because it works well and it's cost effective, but there's certainly other options. So we wouldn't want to uh, require just one option for everybody. We do want to um, offer different solutions for different conditions. Uh, but I will tell you that most people, most developments are using all these different creative ideas, whether it's uh, pervious surfaces or underground storage or other ways to percolate the water into the ground. And that's clearly the direction everybody's going, including the state and our own uh, projects. And so you will see more of the pervious materials, uh, but we're hesitant to make it a hard and fast requirement because we know that every site has some different needs and different different solutions. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, uh, do we know the difference between uh, traditional cement and asphalt uh, versus uh, permeable asphalt and cement? Uh, well, sure. I mean, there are um, there are a lot of differences. Um, I'm not exactly uh, clear on which differences you're interested in, but you know, it, when you have a pervious surface, it's just letting the water through. Structurally, it's still a sound product. It still carries the load of whether it's a parking lot or a road, uh, but the key is underneath that pervious surface, having uh, capacity to hold the, the storm water, to hold the, you know, the design storm event. And so the surfaces are, you know, they're all, good because they just let water pass through while still providing a structural element to to hold up vehicles and, and different loads. Right. And then as far as uh, trees, planting trees, open space, uh, green areas, yeah. uh, you know, I'd like to see more of that. I mean, and nobody wants to live in a, uh, a cement area. They want to uh, well, if you look at the richer areas of Santa Cruz County, they all have trees and shade. Yeah, absolutely. You bet. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. There uh, are no other comments or uh, Supervisor Coonerty? Uh, sure, just very briefly. Um, this is the beginning of the beginning. Uh, I appreciate the plan for outreach. Uh, I do, the, the arena numbers are daunting and the lack of state support um, to actually meet those goals um, <clears throat> is uh, is very real. I do wanna say I some of the pieces that you're talking about, I think um, are exciting because they make our community more vibrant and livable. Um, I, think, I think some of the transformations of land use uh, as our economy shifts and uh, as housing types change, um, Will, will be welcome and that um, will actually lead to a much uh, better better and brighter community. So I wanna appreciate the staff for their outreach and I look forward to hearing more about um, what we can do after, after we get community input. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, some comments and questions here. Um, first, I just wanna underline on, on the barriers and constraints part of the uh, housing element analysis. I think it's, it is really important that we talk to uh, the private sector, to home builders who are building the majority of these units and understand where they're getting caught up in our process. And of course, our entire county has made great efforts uh, to begin to streamline the process. You know, we, at our last meeting, put out the position description for a unified permit center manager. It's a great step also in terms of unifying the public works and planning departments. Um, and I, I think we need to continue that effort in terms of streamli streamlining the process by, by talking to the people actually building the homes and understanding where they're getting caught up. Some questions. Um, the first is, if we increase density and add, uh, or you know add units to the zoning map like now, for example, does will those count towards the future arena numbers? Yes, they would count toward the future because they're not included um, in our inventory, our fifth cycle inventory. So 
Um, for instance, a large property that might have, we might have attributed a capacity of 30 units, whatever new um, zoning would, the number of units would, would be allowed under new zoning would then be included in the sixth cycle. Got it. So anything that's been added since the fifth cycle was submitted will be, will count in the sixth cycle. That's great. Um, you know, you, you talked about the sustainability update and how, I mean, really that was step one of this two-step larger process to add housing capacity to our community. And and I know the planning department did a phenomenal amount of public outreach as part of the sustainability update. Uh, just wondering how you thought that went as far as the people that actually engaged with the process, um, you know, whether it's just raw numbers or, you know, quality of response. Yeah, we did have uh, collect some numbers, but I'll speak to the quality a little bit. Um, we really, in the sustainability update, and we'll review this next time, of course, but we really tried to provide a variety of ways in which people could um, uh, could participate. So um, we did a number of community meetings in the evenings. Um, and we did study sessions at all of or all of the commissions that would be four of the commissions. We went out to the RTC. We we really tried to provide a large um, opportunity. We had a, a survey. We received a lot of comments via that. Um, we did email blasts. We did social media uh, blasts. We worked with Jason Hoppin on press releases and getting advertisements out and. Facebook and and other areas, and so we really want to try to build on on that again. Um, the traditional kind of advertisements in newspapers aren't as effective anymore. Um, and I I think you know when you see how much people are relying. Uh oh. Oh. <laughs> Good. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Little on uh, social applications like next door, you really want to try to make sure that you're accommodating all those various options. But um, yeah. Great, thanks. And uh, how much, I mean, I think the report mentioned that uh, we do have some money budgeted for public outreach. I think, we, uh, you know, also we got a regional early action planning grant or REAP grant from AMBAG. About how much money is budgeted for public outreach for the housing element? Um, we still have a little bit of flexibility on that. The um, REAP chair. We, we may have a disruption to the internet as a result of the earthquake. Um, okay. Is everything all right? We need to take a short break. Pause for like 10 minutes. Sure. All right. We'll take a 10 minute break and return at 11.50. Okay, we'll now resume the regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Presentation. Huh? You're noticeable. You're really shaking things up, Stephanie. Okay. All right, so uh, I was asking about our public outreach plan um, and about how big the budget is for that. You said it's, we're still. Um, so the grant was for $500,000. Um, the guidelines were very flexible with that grant. And so we didn't really have to put our budget together um, line by line. We did use 100,000 of that in permit streamlining. And we, so we have uh, approximately 400 left and we'll use a chunk of, of that, maybe hopefully under 100 for the CEQA and public outreach consultant that we're gonna bring on board to help us with those elements. Um, and then a lot of it will go to staff time. Um, so there will be, we do have room to still refine a real budget and figure out how we want to spend it on those types of elements. Great. Um, you know, I guess what I'm getting at here is I, I, I'm certain that this is going to ultimately be a, a difficult and controversial topic in the community. Um, you know, we have 
certainly watched the city try and fail multiple times with the corridors plan, which uh, has a lot of similarities to the task that we have at hand here. Um, I know I've heard quite a bit, especially in recent weeks, about some elements of the sustainability update. And I mean, I mean fundamentally, what we're asked to be uh, being asked to do here by the state to put more uh, low and very low income housing in well resourced communities. I mean, that's, uh, it's going to be controversial. And um, I think we have an opportunity to try to improve the way that we do public outreach on this topic. Uh, you know, we had the report earlier today about a Santa Cruz like me, which specifically said that um, in our traditional processes, we don't see uh, uh, ample representation from people from South County, from Latinos, from renters, critically, um, and, and from youth. And, you know, those are all groups which have an important stake in the housing conversation. And so given that, given that we actually have some, some resources to do robust public outreach, I think that we have an opportunity here to try something uh, like a citizen assembly, which is both representative uh, and deliberative. And so the representative part is that people would be invited from throughout the community. I mean, similar to selecting a jury with a random selection uh, of citizens. And um, then that group would be it could be winnowed down to something that looks like what our actual population is. I mean, in terms of renters, homeowners, youth, uh, and different ethnicities. Um, and then deliberative in, to the extent that that group would be able to meet multiple times, actually get to understand some of the issues and talk to one another about this these issues. Because I'm, I'm certain that when we get to the end of this, uh, there's going to be a lot of people that say, hey, I never heard about it one way or another, no matter you know, how diligent our efforts are to do the outreach. But at least if we are able to say, well, we had someone that, you know, looks like you involved in this process, and this is some of the conclusions they came to, I think that's going to really add a legitimacy and trust in the whole process. Um, so, and I think ultimately, uh, as we you know, roll out the the housing element and uh, some of the rezonings involved with that in the future. Um, we'll we'll continue to help us all be on the same page as a community. So, um, I know we have to, to hear from the public and and all that, but that's just some of the, the thoughts on my mind today. It seems like it's um, a good confluence of of things here that bring us to this. So, any other comments or questions from board members before I open it to the public? Well, <laughs> I have one Advisor more Cabot. comment, if sure. I may. And uh, when we're building low-income and very low-income housing, uh, do we get? Uh, do you get pushback? Uh, I know when we did in uh, South County, I call it the Minto Project. Uh, it had another name, something Knowles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Eric uh, Shapiro. Shapiro knows, uh, and I believe it was about 80 units. And uh, there are uh, people in the neighborhood who were saying, well, we don't want low income housing coming in here. Uh, I will say that that was probably about 10 years ago. And uh, the neighborhood is very happy with uh, uh, Shapiro Knowles uh, Minto area now. Everything kind of worked out, the traffic, the people are good. Uh, yeah. So what I'm getting at is uh, uh, if, could we put a low income, a very low income in a more affluent area of the county? And uh, would, that, uh, would that fit? So we don't have poor living in one area, rich living in another. And I'll give you one little comment. My my wife and I were we went to Carmel a couple of years ago, and uh, you know shopping, looking around or whatever. Uh, prices are very high, and I was talking to one guy there that lives in Carmel, and I said, "How do you uh, if you buy a house here? How do you even afford all of the uh, property tax, the cost of living out here?" Now I'm quoting him, not me. He said, the higher it is, the cost, the better it is, we like it. Because it keeps the, uh, he used a, a word like uh, trash out of our area. And uh, that's a sad comment. 
And so are we able to somehow uh, integrate uh, the very low income with the more affluent areas? Yeah, so the uh, requirements I was discussing about affirmatively furthering fair housing um, is going to really make jurisdictions look at where we're putting our housing, our higher density housing, which by its nature should be more affordable if it's not outright uh, affordable by by deed. Um, and 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 we really will have to look at our higher resource areas where there's good schools and and services are available. And we need to look at our historic pattern that has led to segregation. It's not only this community, of course, it's all communities. It goes back, 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 way back to the 20s in, in um, all kinds of, of uh, laws and regulations that permeated uh, uh, zoning. So um, we really are gonna be looking at that much more closely in this round. And the areas that we do rezone are going to have to meet some of those high resource areas. Yeah. And, and I think the more affluent areas would, uh, um, uh, they would see how low income and very low income actually does fit in very well as time goes by. So. Yeah. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Mr. Chair. Supervisor Friend. Yeah, I appreciate Supervisor Caput's comments. Um, Supervisor Caput has, has always been steadfast in, in making that case. I think it is important um, that the county actually point out that that's exactly what we've done in the last, if you look at the last, I just didn't want it to go unsaid because if you look at the last number of, of uh, affordable, very low income, moderate, in, well, moderate income and below, but even extremely low income, those projects have occurred exactly in the census tracts that you're speaking of. For example, the Aptos Blue project, uh, extremely low income, the Sea Ridge project, uh, low income. The project that's uh, the partnership with Dientes is actually not in a low income census tract in my colleague's district, and he's been supportive of. So I just want to point out that what the county has built of uh, very low income projects in the unincorporated area in the last since you've been on the board have actually been in the exact exact census tracts that you're advocating for right now. Now moving forward uh, with this work that we're doing with the housing element. By the way, in the sustainable pro, uh, plan, which will be a pretty extensive discussion, there will be even broader discussions about how to expand it beyond where it currently is. But it's it's worth knowing that that, that the county's done exactly is what you're saying, um, uh, and putting those those recent projects in those areas. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. All right. If there are no other comments or questions from board members, is there anyone in the public that wishes to comment on this item? Seeing no one here in chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, there is. Tara, your microphone is now available. Thank you so much. This has been really uh, a valuable opportunity for me to learn what's going on. I have some knowledge of how the, the housing element fits into the whole process. And what I want to ask is, <clears throat> excuse me, when we do the community meetings, can we also offer an explanation how the basic element is a foundation and then the planning policies, building codes, and zoning comes out of that? I think that's where my neighbors in Pleasure Point get confused. And so if, if we could offer that, because people are not only, I'm not only concerned about density, I'm concerned about how are we going to handle the water, the, I'm sorry, the, the sewer issues that we have in this neighborhood. How are we going to water handle transportation since the bus system does not serve well? So thank you so much. Those are all questions that I hope come up in the community meeting process. Thank you, Tara. Rafa, your microphone is now available. Yes, uh, good afternoon. I apologize if this was already addressed during the staff presentation. I uh, was late to, to this meeting, so I only got to catch the last few minutes. Um, but um, uh, one thing that I'm concerned for Santa Cruz County with um, uh, moving forward with adopting a compliant housing element by the statutory deadline is um, 
our our need to complete the rezoning and uh, the need to do that uh, within the requirements of the law. Um, my understanding is that um, we'll have to probably have to to complete um, an EIR for the housing element itself. Um, and and we should start planning those environmental documents as soon as possible so that they can be ready to go by the time that we are ready to adopt something by the end of next year. Um, I realize it's sort of a chicken and egg problem where we don't necessarily know exactly how many housing units or the density or whatever that we have to be planning for. And we haven't even begun to look at sites for our site inventory, but um, these are really, you know, parallel tracks that will be need to be need to be working on um, so that we do have all of the environmental uh, uh, work sort of happening in parallel as we're we're working through the community engagement process on um, identifying sites and on moving forward with the programs and policies. Um, I helped the city of Santa Cruz move forward with some recommendations. Uh, that they're looking at uh, as part of their housing element uh, policies. And I encourage the the county to uh, look at some of the ideas that the, uh, the city of Santa Cruz has already uh, committed to investigating as part of their update process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafa. We have no more speakers. All right, then I'll return it to the board for action. Um, Mr. Chair, I just um, one comment and then I'd like to, make, like to make a motion. I think the county has 600 parcels, I you know, from A to Z, I guess, in size. Do we have any idea of how much, uh, how many of these are potentially buildable or is it, would it be in this process? We'll probably, I'm sure we're going to get to that uh, somehow, but um is that going to be part of it? And I, I really do appreciate, and I think the public should know and following up on uh, Supervisor Friend's comments that we're we're moving in this direction the best way we can, I think. And I, I, I applaud the planning department and public works and everybody else for getting us to a good place as good as can be. And it's going to be a bigger challenge now. But do we, is there any way to identify where those parcels that the county owns, and I think it's hundreds of them, uh, might be buildable? Um, Maybe that'll be come up or could come up in a discussion um, with this. Uh, well, the motion that I would like to make that um, I just move the recommended actions with additional direction, as was mentioned by uh, Chair Koenig, uh, that the staff uh, release an RFP uh, request for, for proposal for a public engagement process is both representative and deliberative, as mentioned by Chair Koenig. Um, that's, I, I think it's spelled out, as you said, I think there's $100,000 for that kind of a purpose. And I think it's absolutely essential that we get a, a broad spread of the community represented in coming to some requests or some proposals from that. So I'd like to make that motion. That we do, uh, we do um, release an RFP for public engagement process that is both uh, representative and deliberative. I think is the best way to put it. I'll second. Any further discussion? Yeah. I mean, uh, and I'll just clarify, you know, both uh, there, there are, I, I'm aware a number of consultants out there that can help at this point with this type of a public engagement process. Um, so for example, I know Eugene Oregon created a citizen review panel on housing and uh, recently 2020, 2021, uh, the city of Petaluma recently had a 36 person citizen advisory panel on the future of its fairgrounds. Um, so some of the organizations that uh, the organization that worked with that, uh, them on that was Healthy Democracy. There's also the Center for Deliberative Democracy at Stanford, uh, which has done this on the scale of the state and even the country, uh, and then the Sortition Foundation. So I, I do think that if we put out this type of RFP, we'll, there's an, enough of an ecosystem out there that we would get a robust response. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? 
All right. Item passes as amended. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, Assistant Director Hansen. We'll now proceed with item nine to consider a first quarter report for fiscal year 2022-23 on cannabis licensing office operations and direct staff to return on or before January 31st, 2023 with the second quarter report for fiscal year 22-23 as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. And for a report on this item, we have our cannabis licensing uh, office manager, Sam LaForty and Deputy CAO, Melody Serena. Go ahead. Good afternoon, board. Thank you. Um, one more. In the first quarter, we've continued to see some contraction in our local market. An additional 11 cannabis businesses closed for bringing the total from last year to 31. Um, this quarter, we have not received any pre-applications. On the compliance front, we continue to find minor paperwork issues associated with uh, site diagram changes primarily, uh, which contributed to the three corrective actions you see in the report. No compliance issues resulted in citations or violations for our licensed operators. On the enforcement front, uh, in the previous report, staff identified a thriving illicit market as part of the problem for the statewide market. And while this remains true, our local illicit market has decreased significantly. Uh, we believe this decrease in the illicit market is uh, largely due to our CCU team's proactive enforcement work and the economics of the illicit industry have changed. Um, essentially, prices have decreased so much that profit margins are shrinking. Uh, the directive of the directives of the board and the funding for the CLO and CCU teams have continually shown progress in decreasing human health and safety, environmental degradation, as well as fire risks related to the illicit market. On the fiscal front, we are 25% through the year. We've received 15% of our budgeted revenues and spent 14% of our budgeted revenues, uh, which has resulted in a net general fund cost to the county of 78,500 to date. Uh, with regard to taxes, we have received 16.6% .6 of our total budgeted cannabis business taxes for the year, uh, which is approximately 324,000 below projections for the first quarter. Retail CBT is down approximately a third and um, non-retail CBT is down approximately 83% from the same time last year. Um, so with regard to the previous board motion, revenue enhancement options, um, staff have included five options which were included in the October 19th, 2021 <laughs> board letter for your discussion today. These considerations were developed in response to the previous board direction to present options to help support the local cannabis industry and help increase the tax base. Um, market, volatility, market volatility has resulted in significant decreases in the wholesale cost of goods since these options were developed. And staff does have some concerns that this volatility uh, may not produce some of the desired revenue results. Some options may result in decreased short-term revenues and may lead to increased neighborhood concerns, while others may result in small revenue increases and impact other economic sectors, principally tourism. If the board does wish to pursue any of these options, um, particularly the retail-related options, staff would suggest that we seek community input via a series of meetings in each supervisorial district before the end of the calendar year and present the recommendations based on those results in January. Um, staff is available to answer any questions you may have on the quarterly report and the options to support the legal industry at this time. Thank you, Mr. LaForty. Are there comments or questions from board members? Yes, Mr. Chair, if I may begin. Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. LaForty. Uh, thank you, Ms. Reno, as well, for your work on this. Uh, it is clear that we're dealing with a pretty volatile market. I agree with the general staff recommendation, which is, um, well, the staff recommendations are just, in essence, maintain status quo. I mean, to me, I think it's clear that the market is shaping up and in particular on the cult is shaking up and in particular on the cultivation side, I don't think that it's 
at its current scale anyway, that it's going to continue to be a viable element of the industry locally. We've seen, as you know, uh, Mr. Laforte, and you've reported on a decrease in the number of people seeking licenses, a decrease in the number of people trying to uh, convert agricultural parcels into cannabis. Um, but as a result of that, I mean, we've got high land costs, high labor costs, and an oversaturated local market. I mean, I just don't think that uh, it's really in the county's best interest to be doing anything to artificially prop up the industry, uh, especially in this changing landscape right now. Um, as the point that you had noted, I mean, the, the greatest conflict points in this board uh, recently dealt with this on, on a uh, appeal component uh, deals with neighbors and cultivation sites with the decrease in, in cannabis business tax associated with, in particular, on the cultivation side and some of the other non-retail operations, uh, it seems that it would be in our best interest to not make any regulatory or tax-related changes, or to, for that matter, to even do this, the community-based outreach that you're speaking of, because I just don't think that it makes sense for us to do that. We don't do this for any other industry, by the way. I mean, uh, we've got a lot of regulated industries within our world. We have uh, special tax industries, including, say, like transit occupancy tax. Uh, when things start to go out of business or challenges occur, we don't uh, talk about an entire re-regulatory landscape in order to address issues for them. So I don't understand uh, why the board would even consider doing anything to, to improve the regulatory landscape or tax-related structure on this. The last point that I think is important to, to note, because um, you know, I know that we have one new, relatively new board member since the time that this board explored the tax cycle on this, um, you know, we had a pretty extensive study that was presented to the board um, HDL, I can't remember exactly the name of the, the consultants that had pr provided it. Those numbers never panned out for the county. I mean, I mean, and it's clear to me that any sort of changes or in, in taxes or, or regulation won't ever make those numbers pan out. Those estimates at the time had said that we would get somewhere between three and 20 times the, the tax revenue uh, that the county has actually received. And as a result of it, it just strikes me that that uh, the industry is shaking out in a way that that retail will probably continue to be successful within Santa Cruz County, but cultivation and some of the other non-retail elements will not. And I think that our structure shouldn't be uh, how do we chase it by by changing regulations and taxes in order to prop up elements that just aren't going to be successful in our area because of external market forces and things that are inherent to Santa Cruz County, uh, like land costs and labor costs that mean that it won't really work out. Anyway, I appreciate the report. I supported the additional direction that came from the chair at the time just because um, I know that it was an issue of interest to him, but I'm not supportive of doing anything different than we're currently doing, especially at this kind of volatility. And so I'm just supportive of the staff recommendation right now, which is an accepted file and moving forward as is. But thank you for the report. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Seeing no other member of the board that wishes to speak on this, I mean, I'll just, you know, say a couple things, which is, you know, first, I think that, you know, Santa Cruz, like it or not, cannabis is a part of the Santa Cruz brand. And, you know, I think that we'll see that uh, as part of the continued retail sales one way or another. Um, but I think that there is still an opportunity both for manufacturers, distributors, and cultivators in our community. And, you know, during this period of fluctuation, um, you know, rather than necessarily just see it as, as you know, propping up a, a dying industry, I think it's how do we stabilize uh, stabilize the industry and also provide an opportunity to improve things going forward. I mean, I see even with the proposal number three to increase canopy limits in specific areas. Uh, I mean, we, as Supervisor Friend said, we know that the biggest point of conflict here is between cultivators and residents. And so in designing an, a, a policy there where we allowed consolidation of growing operations, uh, it seems to me that that would actually decrease conflicts. And especially if we made that based on, um, you know, basically a, a good record by those cultivators of not having issues uh, of, of conflict with the surrounding area, that that, that could be a win-win. Um, uh, you know, furthermore, use of established greenhouses on on CA parcels. Uh, I mean, I've seen firsthand how uh, many in uh, in our agricultural industry who have these greenhouses, a lot of them left over from the cut flower business, have 
seeing cannabis as a way to both uh, maintain existing operations, including a, you know, a variety of different farm products, whether it's cut flowers uh, and diversifying with cannabis with another crop, as well as to uh, get more revenue to reinvest in those businesses and fixing up those facilities. Furthermore, maintaining uh, cannabis within a greenhouse is really the, the, the most controlled possible area you can imagine uh, because there are is, is the opportunity to, to scrub odor, control light, um, and pretty much contain the entire operation within a single building. So I, I think that ultimately those both those policies can be win-win and actually reduce the overall impact uh, on the community. Um, and suggestions four and five allowing retail consumption uh sort of the uh, on-site or farm tours um i mean for that pretty much gets at the heart of the biggest two industries in our county which are both tourism and agriculture uh, within the sustainability update that's coming forward i mean there's a number of policies that aim to basically build on the agro-tourism industry uh, within our community. I think that makes sense. It is a potential growth opportunity and it's a potential uh, growth opportunity for the cannabis industry as well. So um, I, I think that there's, there's some good ideas here. I look forward to hearing what uh, my colleagues and the public have to say as well. Um, but ultimately, I think that some of these proposals are an opportunity for win-win for solutions. Mr. Chair, I, I think you raise an interesting point, so I just want to flesh it out a little bit um, on a policy debate side here. I mean, at the end of the day, there's an over-cultivation. I mean, the market is collapsing in part because there's an oversaturation of the actual product, the need, right? So the idea of expanding cultivation size, um, it'd be like saying uh, people are buying less cars, so we should have 10 car dealerships consolidated into one massive car dealership because that's going to somehow improve the industry. It doesn't improve anything. It just means living next to that massive car dealership is going to particularly suck for whatever residents are there. There's an oversupply right now, right? I don't think that we need to create regulations that make it easier to consolidate or make more cultivation if there's too much stock. People are getting out of the cultivation business altogether. I mean, the other elements... Anyway, the other elements are, are separate on the non uh, on the retail side, but I just think that it's just such a hyper volatile industry, and I feel like that what we're doing is chasing regulations uh, to continue to. I mean, it's 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 starting to flesh out. I mean, the, the strengths are within the resident with are within the retail side. Uh, the strengths may be. Um, although I think we're going to have a policy discussion about this in November about elements of the retail like delivery uh, and that kind of stuff, but it may not be in our county in particular with that with the underlying labor and land costs, for example, in the cultivation or even manufacturing or distributing elements of it, and therefore maybe those aren't elements that our our county actually props up. I mean that's that's how it is. I mean there's there's there are things that are more expensive for us to do than they are in Mendocino or the Central Valley. And everybody has competitive advantages. And so I don't see an advantage to us changing a regulatory uh, framework in order to do it. So I think that the underlying economics of it are such that the things that you're talking about actually don't help. I mean, they actually would create additional issues. And we're seeing that play out in how the taxes are playing out right now. If I may respond to it, I mean, uh, the number one concern I've heard from cultivators is that right now they're trying to manage operations across many small sites, which adds cost and time and, you know, also means that 10 neighborhoods are affected instead of one. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that there's, a, as I said, an opportunity for a win-win here in that uh, less overall neighborhoods could be affected and um, the, the individual cultivators could see their costs of doing business go down. Well, we've already consolidated these into very specific, I mean, for example, the, the greenhouse component that you have is already an element of our code. I mean, no new existing structures, for example, within the coastal zone, the purpose of that was to use underutilized greenhouses, specifically called out that we had underused or non-used uh, this is before you got on the board, but greenhouses for that exact purpose. So I don't, I don't know that there's really any modifications that need to be made there. But when you look at the sales numbers of the retail side, when you look at how much is clearly uh, being grown locally, and therefore I mean, we've had local growers acknowledge it's almost 90% that they're exporting out. I just don't know that uh, doing these consolidations are really uh, going to be beneficial. 
I mean, I, I legitimately don't. So, I mean, to me also, since we don't know, it's like the I, what, one of the things I've learned in dealing with this issue for the last 10 years is that when we continually deregulate in order to chase an emerging trend, it's very hard to re-regulate if we find a problem. <laughs> and, and we've found problems with issues. And so to me, we just need to stop where we have, you know, what we have, figure out how the industry shakes out and its strengths and weaknesses locally. And then if there's actually things that need to be done to improve where there's actual things that we need to improve, then we would do it. But I think that that what we did is we we let a genie out of a bottle pretty early on by being the first county in the state to create a regulatory framework on cultivation, by the way. And there was a green rush unquestionably into our area. Since that time, we've been trying to figure out the best ways to deal with it. I mean, do we put it in CA? Where do we, we get out of the hills? I mean, we're dealing with this conflict in the San Lorenzo Valley in this item right now. And so having, changing the regulatory framework now and chasing another episodic component, I think is just bad public policy. And that's why, um, and, and from the case of history, since I've been through this so many times, I think that that's why I'm advocating for just maintaining as is, uh, and, and you know that I'm not in, in, I'm in rare agreement with the, the cannabis licensing office and some of their policy suggestions. I mean, I'm in agreement with, with uh, the recommendation that right now it, it's probably not going to pan out of exactly what you're seeking for, which is so just to maintain the status quo. All right. Thank you. Any other supervisor wish to add comments or questions? Yes. A comment or? Supervisor Cabot. Yep. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're not deciding on any options right now, right? Is that correct? I mean, there, there were five options that have been presented. Uh, the board could choose to advance any of them or not. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I, this will have a big impact. Uh, some of the changes, uh, on South County, uh, I, I I think we're okay where we are right now, personally. And uh, if uh, if this is going to be, uh, we need to look at this real close. Uh, if if we put it off till January the third, I wouldn't even have to worry about it. Just let somebody else handle it, okay? So I I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Supervisor Kennedy. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the CLO office for your report. Um, I think it's just helpful to understand the, what's going on in the ever-changing industry. Um, my basic um, idea is a couple fold. One is uh, I think it's not a bad idea to always iterate and look at adjustments to policies. Um, I also think it's recognizing that um, that the work this board did got us into a place with a with a stable um, cannabis cultivation and licensing um, structure that, that was not a given. And we still see other counties struggling to this day trying to figure out uh, how to approach this issue. And so um, a lot of good work was done to, to get us to this point and then think adjustments can be made. To Supervisor Caput's point, um, I think we're going to have two new board members and those two new those people running right now have um, very different uh, approaches to uh, to cannabis and licensing. And so um, I think it's appropriate to wait and let those new folks engage and um, reset policy. Uh, and so I think that um, this will be a discussion along with housing and many other issues that this uh, board will capably have in the next uh, year or two. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Uh, uh, the, I, I've seen three things that have been very good uh, coming out of uh, uh, when we first started going down the uh, cultivation and the sales of marijuana, to cannabis, and uh, that is uh, cutting down on the Ill uh, illicit cultivation and uh, we've uh, cleaned up uh, some of our environment in the county, which is a good thing. And I'm for the medicinal use of uh, cannabis. So those are th three positives. But there are uh, uh, negative parts that uh, I don't want to get into right now. All right. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. 
Mr. Chair, there's no other uh, comments. I, I agree with the comments have been made, but uh, I just would move the recommended actions. There, is that been done? I'll, I'll come back to you. We uh, do have to hear from the public first. Oh, excuse me. Okay, I'm just getting in a hurry. All right, and uh, Mr. Mr. Laforte, did you want to respond to any comments made? With okay, uh, then I'll open to public comment now. Hi, uh, my name is Aziz. Uh, I'm an owner and manager at DNA Organics. Um, we are in Watsonville. We have five farms, which is partially because of this canopy cap kind of deal that we've experienced. We don't restrict raspberries. We don't restrict anything else. We are an agricultural crop. And as the industry evolves around us and around this county, it will continue to become that. And the reason which we are having trouble competing would say Santa Barbara or Lake County is because of overregulation. It's not that we're pulling reg unnet. It's not that we're pulling regulations back that are necessary. Respectfully, Zach Friend, um, I don't think you recognize what's happening in the overarching industry. Um, a lot of businesses have gone out of business across the state. We're facing clearance sales. This is just part of a new industry. It's not helping a struggling industry. It's helping a child. Like this industry is a child. And if you stifle it, you are going to stifle its development and it will never evolve to what it could be. And I think it's very important that we recognize that, for example, in your district, Caput, um, we paid out $1.2 million in payroll this year, an additional $1.1 million in seasonal payroll, mostly focused going to district two and four residents. So these are things that are under threat and we need to protect them. So rather than continue to stifle the industry, please listen to Mr. Laforte and take into consideration what he's talking about because it's very important to a lot of people here. Thank you. Thank you, Aziz. Uh, hi, Pat Malo. I've had the uh, pleasure of working on this issue for a long time now. Um, first off, um, thank you for not giving up on this completely. I think all of the recommendations are really needed, and um, some of them are actually exciting and what we would need to have the sort of industry that we all talked about together for years and years and years. Um, I think that the second part of the just the report says what we've been saying for years is that this system we built, as much as it was built on good intentions and different people's political perspectives and trying to take account of all of those, it created dysfunction that only the you know largest, most unlucky entities were able to slither through, and we you know have excluded the mass parts of this county who were legal participants in the medical cannabis era from ever participating in this new experiment. We've also spent millions and millions of dollars often unnecessarily ruining people's lives with enforcement and keeping on the same, you know, problems associated with prohibition, even the racial discrepancies of how our, you know, post-medical legalization has been, um, you know, the enforcement's been applied. When we were having this discussion in 2016, now numbers have came out in 2020 that you're five times more likely as a black person to get caught in this, like this enforcement paradigm that we've set up. And we didn't leave room for the core of what we were talking about here, which is, you know, keep it small, keep it local, the equity, the compassion, the legacy, all of that. And, you know, just to answer, I don't want to spend too much time on um, Zach Fred's perspective because he doesn't vote for any policy involving cannabis, but like you, uh, we have been propping you up with the child's fund and all that. And like, we've been paying taxes and like, just get the boot off the neck for a little while. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Melo. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rob Morgan. I'm one of the licensees in the county as well. We have three different parcels uh, in your district, Mr. Caput. Um, 
part of that also, as Aziz mentioned, is because of the canopy limits per parcel based on the parcel size. Um, we've been a compliant operator. We've never had any issues in the county. Um, increasing the canopy limits is something that our business needs to continue uh, to thrive. I think uh, it's a more nuanced issue than uh, what Mr. Friend said, as far as uh, the reason the cannabis industry is where it's at. Um, you can't have just successful retail without successful cultivation. Um, there will be no retail without cultivation. Um, I'm in support of the increased canopy limits uh, within the CA zone. Also the increase of uh, the retail uh, within those zones at those licensed parcels. Um, I think it's something that our industry needs and uh, you know, the retail in Santa Cruz County is also uh, pretty small com in comparison to other counties. Um, so yeah, I wanna thank Sam too, for all the work that he's done with his staff. And uh, hopefully, you know, when we have the new board members, we can, uh, you know, push this uh, further along as we have. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Seeing no one else here in chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? There is. Caller ending in 777, your microphone is now available. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Greg Fernandez. I'm a uh, licensee here. We have 648,000 square feet of greenhouse that is approved um, for cultivation. Um, I'm calling in to, in support of all of the recommendations that uh, Mr. Laforte's office has <clears throat> proffered here today. And I uh, just wanna, uh, you know, I, I'm not, not trying to pick a fight or anything, but Supervisor Friend just does not know what he's talking about. Um, I just got to <laughs> uh, push back on virtually everything that he said. Um, our land costs are very expensive up here, but us operators that are already here, those are sunk. Uh, it's, it's done. Uh, we do need other methods of, of income and profit, basically, and the retail, on-site retail definitely uh, would help us. Um, along those lines. Um, uh, our labor costs are pretty much consistent throughout the state. Um, so it's not really, you know, our, our farm labor is just not that much more uh, here than it is pretty much in any other part of the state with the exception of maybe Lake County or, you know, uh, but, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're stuck in this situation really because of the price of the, this commodity. It has just come down and it's, uh, it's the lowest it's ever been, um, ever. And uh, that has, there's a lot more. There's a speaker there that uh, used the word, uh, the term nuance. There is a lot to this. Um, uh, and it's, it's definitely not anything that could be tackled in a meeting, let alone a two minute uh, uh, you know, uh, period here. So um, I don't believe that any of these actions would be propping up our industry. Um, as Aziz said, uh, we, and another caller said, uh, you know, we were here, uh, we're paying taxes, we're paying payroll. We paid millions of dollars in payroll this year. Um, and we're, we're very excited about the future. And we also have to remember, somebody did say that, hey, we're the first uh, municipality to legalize uh, medical use of, of uh, cannabis Thank way you, back Mr. in Fernandez. the... Darren, your microphone is now available. Hey, everybody. It's Darren's story. Sorry I couldn't make it in today. Um, I agree with Greg and everybody else. We're not looking at oversupply, Zach. What we're looking at is a bad policy that's actually stimulated the black market. Uh, if you look at California, all the studies have shown the California black market is uh, between two and three times larger than it was prior to Prop 64. So anything that allows us to become more efficient allows us to compete with the black market. So really what you're going to do is you're not getting rid of cannabis operators. You're going to push them into the illicit market. So we're not looking to prop up. We're looking to stimulate legal operators that are doing it right. One of the reasons Santa Cruz County has seen a reduction in illicit operators is because Sam's done a lot of work to help us become more efficient and help us compete 
and we can put them out of business. You're not going to put them out of business with enforcement. You can't tax them into oblivion because they're not paying taxes. So you really have to help us out. Um, and that's, that's really, you know, anything that can help us become more efficient. We don't need to become bigger. No one's looking to add canopy. They're just looking to consolidate it. So they're not running around all over the county, putting emissions into the air. Um, workers are on the road, unnecessary traffic, et cetera. So whatever you guys can do to help us become more efficient, that's greatly appreciated. Zach, if you ever really have questions about um, how we're operating and how things are becoming more efficient, you know, you can reach out to us. I don't think the industry is dying. I think it's becoming more mature and we're able to deliver it to the consumer for a lower price. So it is going to grow. You just have to help us compete against the black market, which is growing faster than us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Story. Chair, we have no more speakers. All right, then I'll return it to the board for deliberation and action. This one, I'll move the uh, recommended action. I'll second. We have a motion by Supervisor McPherson, a second by Supervisor Friend. Uh, as exactly. What exactly are we voting on? The recommended actions today are simply to accept and file the fiscal year 2022-2023 first quarter report on cannabis licensing office operations, and two, to direct staff to return on or before January 31st, 2023, with the second quarter report for fiscal year 22-23. Okay, so the uh, the option, we're not voting on the option. No, we're not. Uh, the, the motion does not include any of the options. Not, not on. But is that correct? Just a few recommended actions. Right. That's what I'm looking at here. You know, I'll just add, I, you know, I'm sympathetic to the fact, Greg, that you said, or Supervisor Caput, uh, that, you know, by January of this coming year, during the, the next report, you'll no longer be sitting here. You won't have to to uh, deal with this issue. And I mean, I think rightfully so, given that cannabis does impact the fourth district uh, significantly, it would make sense that if uh, we were to consider any changes for the industry, that it, uh, it would be done by your successor in the fourth district. Supervisor Mr. Friend. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I just may ask a oh, yeah. question. Um, when we first started on the cannabis licensing office reports, because it, we were, we had like a high level of, of insecurity and instability within the industry, and you actually use the word Mr. LaForte is stable in your report. Um, we were getting quarterly reports, and I'm and I'm just not sure if that if we need to continue to do that. I mean, do you do the do you two feel that quarterly reports are still needed, or should we move this? Because it feels like we we have these reports and we have these discussions. They may not need to happen every couple of months. Should we go into a twice a year situation? I mean, we don't have anything else that we get quarterly reports on, and so I'm just asking now that the industry is stabilizing, whether it makes sense as part of this recommended action to actually direct you to, to, to not have quarterly reports, but have them like bi-yearly or, or something to that effect. Um, Melody Serino, Deputy CAO. Um, we would certainly welcome only coming to the board twice a year instead of four times a year. The data is not changing a lot quarterly to quarterly, uh, quarter to quarter. Um, and really um, all that you're seeing is, you know, kind of the incremental notices of violations that may get filed on the enforcement side. Um, I, I think really that it's the fiscal piece that you're always more interested in, um, in terms of what's happening with the CBT, with the cannabis business licensing tax. But uh, I think coming twice a year is probably sufficient at this point. Okay, well, uh, Supervisor McPherson, if you'd be open to uh, an amendment to that motion. I mean, we currently have them coming back in January for the second quarterly report, but just change it to a twice yearly report um, starting at the date. Well, I, I don't know, Ms. Serena, what, what date would you like to start that process? Would you want to start it in January and at that point just then move to a twice a year? What would be easiest for you? I think that would make sense because then, th then we could stay on, on track with uh, being present before budgeting so that you would have some information around budget. Okay, so, so you want you want to have a report in January, is that right? And then in June, or yeah, six so it would just be a modification of the second direction to just come back and to, to change it to a twice yearly as opposed to quarterly report. If you're comfortable with that, Supervisor McPherson, yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. All right, so the revised motion is to adopt the recommended actions and then after the January 31st, 23 report to change to a uh, twice a year report. All right, any further discussion? 
Seeing none, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? No. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. The item passes as amended. Thank you. Five to one, right? Four to one. Four to one. Excuse me, four to one. All right, thank you. That brings us to the end of our regular agenda. The next meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors will be November 15th, 2022. Uh, 22, still 22, yeah. Uh, it will now move into closed session. Are there any reportable actions? No. All right, thank you.